and remote attendance as possible. Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and remotely via Zoom. There are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting via Zoom and make public comment during the meeting is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website or on YouTube. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays at 11 at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our, techni our technician tonight is Quinn. And as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Thank you. Okay, on to item one is roll call. Commissioner Esty? Here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Commissioner Wilk? Here. Vice Chair Jensen? Here. And Chair Christensen? Here. And then uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Um, item two, additions and deletions to the agenda. Item A is um, ad additional materials. Item 6B, correspondence received. Yes, staff received one additional material for item 6B. This was a applicant letter. It's been added to the agenda packet and provided in the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wilk has to recuse himself from the uh, last item on the agenda. So I was wondering if we wanted to reorder and do um, the citywide zoning one first and then do the San Jose Avenue one second. Um, so. San Jose Avenue one after the two sites. Right. So we want to do that one yeah. at the end. And. Um, okay. Okay. If we were to do that, I would suggest that we bump the discussion on the um, Architectural and Design Review Committee first in that zoning code update, because there's quite a few local architects and designers that'll be in the room tonight that possibly could provide feedback. Do we need to make a motion or anything to make that change? I don't I think you can just reorder the yeah. agenda. So we're gonna do San Jose item B public hearing uh yes, c item c will become c and c will become b c will become b so 602 el salto will be a uh -huh. um, citywide zoning code update will be b and 115 san jose will be c perfect okay and then we're also moving the arkin site to that will when we get to the citywide zoning we'll, okay we'll bump that first do you have any interesting uh, tidbits in the director's report that I would miss if I left early? You know, during staff communication, I'll do some updates. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on to um, item three, oral commu communications. Oral communications allows time for members of the public to address the planning commission on any consent item on tonight's agenda or any topic within the jurisdiction of the city that is not on the public hearing section of the agenda. Members of the public may speak up to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the chair. Individuals may not speak for more than, more than once during oral communications. All speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. A maximum of 30 minutes is set aside for oral communication. Nope, seeing none, none on Zoom. Okay, moving on. Uh, item four is planning commission staff, or planning commission and staff comments. Okay, uh, I just wanted to bring you up to date on two items. So our housing element was resubmitted on Tuesday to the state. Uh, we're hoping to get a meeting here in the next week or so with the state representative. They have some time to look at our edits. The only comments we received while it was open for the uh, required seven day period 
was from Yimby, and they were more questions than comments on the update, so that's good news. Um, we're going to make one modification to an error on the map, which um, pointed out the wrong location for 602 uh, Bay Avenue, or 650 Bay Avenue. 750. 750 Bay Avenue, so we'll be correcting that on the map. Um, and I'll be bringing that back to you once, once I've had an update and a chance to talk with HCD and have more information on where we're headed with that. So uh, that's the update on the housing element for tonight. And the second update is really on the, the wharf. And we finished up the wharf survey and we had over a thousand responses, which was fantastic. Um, and then the, this week on Tuesday night, we had a follow-up meeting with um, the public on the wharf and got more feedback. Just a lot of new ideas came in through the survey. So we just um, asked more questions about those new ideas and concerns that came in. We'll have a staff report published tomorrow by 5 p.m on a temporary wharf plan. So look out for that. That'll go to the city council next week and it'll take into consideration everything we've heard up to date. At the same time, um, we'll also have a long-term um, wharf, just getting authorization from the city council to move forward with a request for proposals, looking for an architecture or planning firm to start looking at different options for what could be the long-term planning on the wharf. So. Those two items will go to City Council next week. Um, we're actively moving into budget season at City Council as well. And um, during that, and when we look at the CIP projects, I will definitely be mentioning the uh, concerns of Planning Commission near some of our higher density projects that have come in and looking at roads to make sure that gets on our capital improvements plan. So in the next five years. Okay, so those are my updates tonight. and. It, um, and my director's report combined. So, thank you. Uh, one question about the housing element. Um, you, we significantly expanded the uh, mall, uh, well, you know, number of dwelling units, et cetera, at the mall. Is ECD aware that we're doing that at this point, or did you have any discussions? With yes, so before submitting this and before making all of the revisions, we did talk with our planner at HCD and let them know what we were planning on doing and they were happy with the efforts there. So, as well as the height. Okay. I figured they'd be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I, if there's something else, just follow up on with the, regarding the wharf, just, um, just as a public um, notification, the mosaic um, artwork part, part of the wharf is ongoing now. And so um, it's at the Capitol Mall next to Alta. And it's open, um, let's see, the hours are two, uh, Monday, Thursday from 3 to 7 o'clock, I think, at night. And it's open from 10 to 2 on Saturdays. And so it's all been designed out, which I think everybody has seen. But um, we're encouraging everybody to attend or of the public come out um, and just be a part of the process and everything. So it's great to see it. Um, I stopped by there saw it the other day. It looks great. So just want to make sure we shared that. So I just have one follow-up question on the wharf. So at, at the meeting on Tuesday night, one of the speakers indicated that the wharf is no longer going to be launching private boats. And I wondered if you could follow up on that and let us know if that's accurate or not. Yes, so I think um, that's going to be subject to the lease agreement, which is not in place yet. The previous lease definitely... Um, allowed private boats, so I will follow up on that, but I, um, if... So my recollection was the reason the private boats were allowed was because of the grant that the city received from the Wildlife Conservation District, and part of the requirements in that grant to make us eligible to qualify for it was that there would be the launching of private boats. So I would just like to know how, how that's playing out. Okay. I'll follow up. Anything else? No? Okay. Um, we're moving on to item five with the consent calendar and all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the planning commission to be routine and will be enacted in one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time the planning commission votes on the action unless the planning commission requests 
Specific items to be discussed for separate review. Items pulled for separate discussion will be considered in the order listed on the agenda. Item A, the approval of the April 4th, 2024 Special Planning, Planning Commission meeting minutes. I would like to pull both those items, if that's okay. 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 And so do we need to separate them? Yeah, he's, he's pulling them anyway. Oh. Yeah, I wanted to pull both of them for discussion. <laughs> So pulling item A and item B, meeting minutes and 210 Panmar Way. So do we want to do item A first? Yes, because I have to recuse myself from B. So let's do A and then I will um, run away. So, um, just regarding uh, uh, item 5A um, re, um, on that one regarding the 1090, um, on page 16, the comments weren't exactly clear how I remember them being reflected. Um, one in the, in the sentence says, uh, uh, you know, that the staff will be directed to communicate with city council and the surround, around surrounding streets being relieved of additional parking burdens. And I thought there was a little bit more direction around that, um, that we wanted it to go back to city council and have it, have it reviewed as an item. And I just think, I personally didn't think it reflected 100% of what the full intent behind that um, was during the meeting. So I was wondering if that could be expanded upon or may we go back to um, uh, what the- I think we wanted it to go to the city council so they could at least talk about that when they're discussing their budget because doing any kind of street improvements in these areas around the project definitely will require money and uh, you know time. So just to have staff put that on some list so it gets to the council is something we would like to see them consider. So I, I put together a slide because the sequencing was also off on this um, April 4th meeting. So they, it was usually we, we have the commissioner, um, the presentation, questions, public hearing and discussion, and then that followed by the motion and then the findings and conditions. So that um, I thought should be modified, and I um, at the very end, I did put in some new language because I think it was a request to consider in future road improvement projects to mitigate on street parking impacts. So, to communicate to the city council a request that the surrounding streets be considered in future road improvement projects to mitigate on street parking impacts. Does that cover it? And that, that, that was my plan is at the just coordinating with Jessica that um, this again, similar to the avenues project, be listed as a future capital improvement project. Yeah, that, that's how I remember it. If everybody, else was, if everybody else was fine with that, that's how I remember it. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. I didn't catch that. So I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for this special meeting. Uh, on April 4th. I still had questions on B. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. So do you want to do A for, just vote for both of you? Just my, um, my comment on B. Um, I'm doing A first because I, I can't listen to your B comments. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to make a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting of April 4th. All right. I'll second. That's amended with the staff slide. I'll second that. Roll call. Commissioner SD. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Vice Chair Jensen. Aye. And Chair Christensen. Aye. Well, um, Jerry, would you like a full staff presentation on this or uh, just? Oh, so uh, just item B, you have to recuse you of the 41st <laughs> Avenue one? The Panmar one. Panmar one. I'm talking on the consent and giant and item. Item B. Item B is on the consent calendar. On the consent counter. You need to leave. Yes, you need to leave. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it's I'm still talking about the meeting minutes. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. Wait, the meeting. You just. Oh, I thought you were talking about. Well, sorry. I, so that last comment that we were just picked up was correction of the meeting minutes from the last meeting, correct? Okay. And then item B is um, two seven five on the forty first Avenue Suite A. I see what you're saying. Oh, okay. Sorry. Am I confused? I, no, I, I was I, confused. Don't, I blame it on me. I was. I think there was two items on the. Or there was item A that we just talked about, and item B was at 
2175. Uh-huh. Okay. So it's just regarding the, um, my comment was we separated those two. There was like a, it was dual applicant, I think. Um, it was about the sign and then the relocation. Um, I just also thought um, my, my follow-up on that was just when there seemed like there was a lot of conversation that we had regarding the sign and the height, and we're giving, I don't know if we didn't issue any direction, but we a lot of comments. I was just wanted to make sure that since it was separated, it was noted here that the sign application be reviewed under separate application. Are you guys working with that applicant then? And they've been, I don't know if it was the applicant, I mean, I know the applicant was here, but the person involved in the application for the sign, are they going to be get our, all our comments and um, and you'll be working with them from the staff level on making those changes or recommendations for that to come back to us. Is that and it just yeah. nothing was reflected in here that we talked about the sign and um, per se. Um, it was just said that is it's going to be reviewed under SEP application. I just want to make sure our comments that we all shared that night was communicated to them. So when it comes back, those were picked up. So we have met with that applicant and discussed um, the overall um, need to make a master sign program really work with the four tenants and the height concerns and overall square footage of the monument sign as well as uh, just figuring out the front facade and how it all kind of works together. Those were the comments that we shared and that the monument sign should probably be a shared sign instead of one tenant. Okay. Perfect. I just want to make sure that that was, because it didn't note it in the, any of the meeting minutes that we had that discussions regarding the sign. So that's just, I just want to make sure that was, Document, I guess, somehow. If you'd like, we could definitely add those to the meeting minutes to make it more clear for the record. That'd be great. Just so, okay. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> Thank you. So, do we, you, we can make a motion to amend the minutes that we previously approved to add these comments? Mm -hmm. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay. There's in a second. Roll call. Commissioner SD. Aye. Commissioner Westman, Aye. Commissioner Wilk, Aye. Vice Chair Jensen, Aye. and Chair Christensen. Aye. Okay, can, moving on to item B. Do we want to do a full staff report? Or? Commissioner Jensen, would you like a full staff report on uh, 210 Fanmar, or is it? Um, so again, I, when I was talking about item B, I was talking about item B on the meeting minutes. So oh. it was not pulling the item off consent for directly for FANMAR. Um, so that's why I was saying item B was just on the meeting minutes. Understood. I apologize. For Understood. <laughs> Come on back. Well, yeah, you too you many yeses. And do your motion. Okay. Do we have a do we have a motion to approve item B on the consent calendar, or would anybody like to pull item B on the consent calendar? I'll make a motion to approve uh, 210 Fan Mar Way with the uh, staff conditions and findings for approval. Okay. I'll second that. All right. First and a second. Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Vice Chair Jensen? Aye. And Chair Christensen? Aye. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> I was talking B and it wasn't the right B, I guess. All right. So moving on to uh, item six, public hearings. Public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item listed as a public hearing. The following procedure is as follows. One, staff presentation. Two, planning commission questions. Three, public comment. Four, planning commission deliberation. And five, the decision. Um, the first item is 602 El Salto Drive, item A. The project description is a design permit for first and second story additions to an existing two-story single-family residence, including an attached accessory dwelling unit. We have a staff presentation. Chair Christensen, before we start, I just wanted, I, I noticed more people came in the room, and I just wanted to clarify that the agenda uh, Sequence has changed tonight, so that we'll be looking at 602 El Salto Drive first. Second, we'll be looking at the zoning code updates, mm -hmm. and then we'll move on to 115 San Jose. But I just wanted to make sure everyone in the audience was aware of the change. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item A. 
Thank you, Chair Christensen, and good evening, Commissioners. Uh, so we actually put this item on the regular uh, schedule just to discuss the generator that's being proposed and to see if the Planning Commission had uh, second thoughts about that. So uh, I'm just going to jump into that immediately and, and we can go from there. Otherwise, this would have been on the consent calendar. So this is a uh, ADU permit, design permit, and coastal development permit um, to construct not to construct, but to heavily modify an existing single family dwelling. It includes first and second story additions, um, an attached ADU in the rear yard. Uh, the resulting uh, project would have a 2,235 square foot primary dwelling, as well as a 788 square foot accessory dwelling unit. That dwelling unit is subject to the guaranteed allowance. So even though this project has a far in excess of the zone, uh, threshold, it, it is permissible under state and, and city ADU codes. So the item that we wanted to discuss was the proposed emergency generator. Up here I have the uh, supplemental code standards relating to generators in bold. I have the uh, standards that are most relevant to this discussion. Um, they're already pretty regimented as this was intended to be something that that functions on a ministerial or administrative basis typically as, as long as a, a generator would comply with these standards it would just be a building permit so again this is typically a ministerial process including the allowance for generators to be located in the required rear setback um, so again the uh, generators by code can only be operated for maintenance purposes and testing purposes, as well as for emergency purposes, such as their powers down for whatever reason. Um, there's also limits to when these generators can be uh, run outside of an emergency, and they're they're pretty strict on the placement, um, allowed only in the rear yard, and although not really uh, intended, perhaps they if there is a, a substantial side yard it, they are allowed in this outside of the side yard setback I bring that up because there is potentially location an option on this lot for that but the applicant is proposing in the rear yard the allowed encroachment of up to five feet into the required rear setback uh, is intended to reflect the fact that uh, on especially on smaller lots that it is just not feasible to place a mercy generator um, that would meet building code requirements for for distances from opening or other services um, and be in the rear yard there especially in neighborhoods like the jewel box uh, it's just too tight so that's why we we ultimately developed that now on a uh, corner lot there are some similarities there because they typically have very reduced uh, rear yards as we would define them um, and that is the case in this project so this is a, a photo of the uh, rear half of the project site uh, in orange with the arrow that's pointing to the uh, proposed generator location as well as the proposed enclosure. The rear setback is about six and a half feet. They are allowed to encroach five feet into that requir required setback, allowing approximately a foot and a half of setback from the rear lot line. Um, and that is what they're proposing about 18 inches off of the rear line. It is a part of that is that it's required for placement in the rear yard again um, and that is in discussions with staff they did uh, illustrate why they had proposed it here combination of, of rear and side access as well as a number of new improvements on the rear face there openings for the ADU so there really are improvements pretty much or openings on almost the entirety of the rear wall of the, the proposed improvement and, and, and residents and ADU um, and then there's limited space elsewhere and it can't it also cannot be on the exterior face of, of the lot so that's why they're proposing it behind a small fence area um, staff has included and, and did overall recommend approval on this project but we did include two conditions uh, by default uh, as you can see up here they do uh, reflect the code standards relating to the noise levels 
as well as uh, the time frames when they can be utilized. Um, so if, if the Planning Commission did not have concerns, they could approve this application and these would already be included in the approval. Uh, so with that, um, I can take any questions the Commission has. Okay. Well, I I might be a little confused. I thought that they're going to put a structure around the generator. Is it going to be like the zombie box that we got the information on, or is it a different kind of structure? I, I can let the applicant speak if there's been any changes. We did speak this afternoon, and I, I was under the impression that they weren't proposing any changes to what was shown in the spec attachments. Um, so it, it is still... a component of the project to have the generator and the enclosure. Okay. Could you go over why, so what we're asking, you're asking us is to approve or, or disapprove the setback requirement. That's the only thing that is in violation. It, if the Planning Commission feels that this is a, a warranted use of the encroachment provision, then, they, then you could go straight to an approval motion uh, like I said, that as long as that that is interpreted as consistent with our generator codes, then then it would it would be compliant. So it, it was brought up because this is unusual, especially how close it is to uh, the nape the shared lot line. And as you can see, there's a, an outline of the adjacent building's footprint. Um, we wanted to bring the attention to the planning commission um, to see if what, what they felt on this. And also, um, so. You're asking if it's an exception to the ten to the setback, and it is. It's a request as an exception to the ten foot setback. And so I want to re review why we have that setback. The history of that setback is because of neighbors complaining of noise, because that's considered a building, and we have building setbacks. I mean, just why is that setback? rule there my recollection is that when we did the last updates to the code um, this is maybe two or three years ago we we did a revision in which we added standards for generators and during that time I think there was concern about noise um, and we they're prohibited in the side yard setback but because this is a corner lot it's essentially a side yard. So during that time, we were concerned about, the Planning Commission was concerned about noise, so we only allowed it in the rear yard. And why this one is so unique is because their rear yard is essentially a side yard. But noise was the concern. So if noise is a concern, I'm just wondering, if, you know, um, perhaps it would make more sense to put it in the front yard or some of these op more open spaces from a, from a noise standpoint. Um, again, if the neighbor, if, if our issue is noise and it's right next to the lot line and we made a point of creating that municipal code item, it's like, well, all right, what other options? Well, okay, if you moved it in a different area, the front yard or something, that, and you, you would, that would be unadvisable because of just the unsightliness. Oh, I'm, I'm the one, I think, who brought up the generator issue. And I think in this case, and my concern is noise, not unsightliness. And they do have an unusual parcel here because it's this corner lot. So what we would think of as their rear yard is technically, by zoning rules, a side yard. So it seems like this is a technicality that staff can't just approve it without bringing it to us because of what the ordinance says. And for me, if they're going to put a structure around it, which you know they say they are, and so the noise is going to be mitigated, then I wouldn't have any problem with it. And I think you know we could approve the whole project with the exception for the generator to be in the side yard. OK, so I'm, just, I'm trying to get an understanding of you know, why it's there, and, and if if you're saying that um, the code actually should read, you're allowed to put it near the lot line if there's sufficient noise mitigation, like put a box around it or something like that, 
you know, are we, we setting precedent here saying that, well, as long as you, you can put it right up against your fence line right next to your neighbor, as long as you have a box around it. Is that, is that what the precedent we're setting here? I think we're setting the precedent that as long as they can mitigate the noise, which is what I see as the problem with those kinds of generators, then um, they should be able to put it here. But in most areas, like my neighborhood, you know, side yards are only three feet wide, sometimes four feet wide. And so, you know, putting a generator in my neighborhood on someone's side yard is a real issue. And I think that's one of the reasons that they came up with, um, you know, the zoning code amendment that we have adopted. I have a couple Questions. comments regarding. Um, so, what is the decibel rating of the generator without the enclosure? I, I don't think it actually showed the the raw uh, output at at the center. It had at a distance. As it's uh, fifty. I just looked at it. It's sixty-one. D, this is a thirty-eight kW generator. Is sixty-one uh, dBA. So sound pressure levels at 61 dB. It's pretty, and, it's pretty good, actually. Right. And with the enclosure? Barrier, the barrier states it, it's barrier description is not very good. It says uh, can cut the noise down by 50%, but then in their actual data, they show only about a 30% reduction in noise. It's still pretty good. So you're down to, you know, roughly 50 dB um, not, when it's operating, which is not... Not too bad. Right. Ambient, is, they claim ambient is 43. I don't know around here. If, when the motorcycles go up and down Park Avenue, it's a lot higher than 43 dB, I tell you that much. But <laughs> I think this they've done a good job of, of doing, like, you couldn't really put this generator anywhere else on the property and have a property look good. And or you would need a very long line back to your pan electric line. So I think they've done a good job of placing it and trying to, you know, do what they can to mitigate the noise. and Presumably, it's not on that often. Mm -hmm. so. My other question would be is, um, has the, this project wouldn't have been posted or notified to any, or was it noticed? Yes. So it was noticed regarding the generator as? The generator was not specified in, in the, the public posting. This this isn't a variance or a minor modification, and, and that's why at the beginning I wanted to clarify that that those standards were developed with the intention of being um, something that staff would utilize on a, on a ministerial level. A, a building application would come in for an emergency generator. It would be routed to, uh, to us for a zoning overview, and we'd, we'd confirm that they complied with all those generator standards, and, and if so, just uh, approve it. Um, if it was something they wanted to encroach that rear setback, it, it wouldn't explicitly require planning commission approval. It would require them to demonstrate that there is a, a need to encroach the rear setback for the purpose of keeping that generator in the rear lot. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? No? Um, do we hear from the applicant or? Good evening, Commissioner. Um, this is Jen uh, is from my office and she is, she actually is the one that put the stuff oh. if you could speak directly into the microphone it, it they won't pick it up in the sound room <laughs> is that good enough okay, okay. <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, Jen was the one that put together the, the specifications for this uh, for this particular generator and I think that the uh, your analysis is is very well well put. It's it, there there is really only one space that works, and it is possible to mitigate the, uh, the amount of noise, and it's not and it's not used for very very much. So <clears throat> only a time in an emergency or if it's being serviced or uh, some other uh, purpose. But I urge you to uh, vote for favor of this uh, go along with the rest of it uh, and uh, be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, We can open up for a public comment. Is there anybody that'd like to speak to this? No? Hearing none. Um, we're going to bring it back to the Planning Commission for deliberation. It, it's, we kind of covered a lot of points. Yeah, I, I would make a motion to approve the project um, you know, with the conditions um, with the generator and um, the noise attenuation going with it. So, um, so I guess I ought to say the whole thing, a design permit for a first and second story addition to an existing single family residence, okay. um, including the accessory dwelling unit with staff's findings and conditions. So is there a special uh, condition that you're adding regarding the noise mitigation? We the indicated those were already in the condition. I got it. That's correct. Okay, so there's a motion. I'll second. A second. We have a roll call. Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Vice Chair Jensen. Aye. And Chair Christensen. Aye. Okay. Pass. Thank you. Um, okay. Moving on to item B is uh, oh excuse me item reordered item B um, is citywide zoning code update. It's, for future amendments to the Capitola Municipal Code, Title 17 zoning. Presentation is in the cloud right now. It's just going to take a minute. Okay. Yeah. Could we take like a three minute recess into the next part? We're taking a three minute recess. Okay. Is everybody ready to continue? You guys okay? Or do you want to wait a minute? I think we're ready. <laughs> so I don't think we have any local architects in the room anymore. So we'll just start from the beginning of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Rather than get feedback on our consultants. From the beginning. Plan A. Plan B. <laughs> Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Ben Noble. I'm the city's consultant assisting with the zoning code amendments. Okay. So um, this is a continuation of your discussion from last February. Um, where the city is making amendments to the zoning code um, in order to implement uh, the recently adopted housing element, as well as to make other um, uh, uh, amendments to the zoning code to address other issues that have come up. So we will go to um, item four. Back to plan B. <laughs> And, um, and so uh, there are a number of programs within the housing element that um, call for the city to consider amendments to the zoning code um, or make amendments to the zoning code. Some of these programs require um, or warrant planning commission discussion um, before staff prepares the uh, draft amendments. So the purpose of the meeting tonight is to bring to you some of these issues for uh, feedback and direction um, that we will then use to prepare the amendments to bring back to you 
at a future meeting. So on the screen are the four topics that we have um, for tonight. And we're going to start with topic, topic number four. Uh, and then once we complete that, um, receive um, planning commission feedback, receive public comment, uh, we'll then uh, go to topic number one, two, and three. All right, so topic number four that we're starting with tonight is the, de the design permit process. And at the February Planning Commission meeting, the Planning Commission discussed potential changes to the development and design review committee process, which in 2022 replaced um, the prior architecture and site review committee process. Uh, the Planning Commission discussed um, some of the benefits of the prior process as well as um, some of the benefits of the new process and uh, asked staff to return with some options um, for how the Planning Commission or how the city could potentially um, improve the current process that exists now. Uh, one of the things that staff did was reached out to local architects uh, and designers, applicants of design review projects to receive feedback on the process today as well as the prior process. Uh, a survey was created which was shared with a group of local uh, architects and designers. Uh, to date, uh, staff has received uh, one response uh, to that survey. Uh, some additional responses may come in, and if they do, we'll most definitely share the feedback that we got. And I apologize, there was a um, mistake in the staff report where it references an attached response. Uh, that response wasn't attached, uh, so instead I will summarize what we heard um, from uh, the one response that we did receive. This was from an individual who had experience under the prior ARC and site process, which included um, uh, two professional designers, one uh, architect, one landscape architect, as well as city staff. Uh, that This individual uh, went through that process as well as the more recent uh, design review committee uh, process as well. And uh, this uh, individual felt that the prior, prior process offered some benefits, particularly there was early feedback uh, on the design of the project, which ended up streamlining eventual planning commission review. Um, and some concerns that uh, under the new process, the uh, project would go to the planning commission with some uh, design issues not sufficiently vetted prior to that, which um, increased the number of meetings before the planning commission. Uh, so this person felt that early input from design professionals um, that was previously provided from the uh, Arkan Site Committee was valuable um, and that uh, returning to that kind of thing um, would provide some benefits. Um, this person did point out that uh, having a reasonable time frame for a early uh, Arkan Site Committee review is very important and that would be necessary or important to incorporate into um, a revised process if the city does that. So um, when thinking about this and reflecting on input, uh, we put together four sort of different options that the Planning Commission might consider. Um, the Planning Commission may have some other ideas as well, and there might be some combinations of different ideas here that might end up working out best. Um, the first option is essentially to, con to continue and formalize um, some of the things that staff is doing now um, that have recently been implemented to address some of the Planning Commission's comments on the process. So under this option, which we're calling enhanced staff review, city staff would continue to review uh, design permit applications for single family homes um, with an early meeting with the applicant, applicant and focusing on uh, review of the project for conformance with design review criteria and standards. Um, staff, if staff recommends changing changes to the project design uh, from this review, that those recommended changes would be communicated to the applicant in writing, and then also communicated to the plan, com planning commission 
um, when it goes before the Planning Commission uh, with information on whether or not the project was modified in any way to respond to um, staff comments. So this would be a way um, to make sure that it was very uh, transparent to the Planning Commission what recommendations came from staff and whether or not the project was revised in any way um, to address those comments. Option two um, uh, involves outside review of projects of concern. So currently, uh, if there is a multifamily project proposed or a non-residential project proposed, um, the city would utilize, utilize city contract design professional um, to assist with the design review process. So in this option, if staff feels that there's a issue of concern with um, the proposed project that uh, that uh, city contract a design professional will be brought into the process to work with the applicant um, to see if those concerns can be resolved with um, that uh, discussion being communicated to the planning commission when the application comes before the commission so the difference would be that this this uh re contractor review would would now apply to r1 applications or single family home applications on projects of concern as identified so desired yeah okay and right now, it's we kind of do it on the multifamily ones, R R R R M. Multifamily and commercial. Okay. Okay. And so I think another idea that was um, discussed by the planning commission was to make um, outside review of the design permit application optional um, for an applicant who is interested in that additional feedback. Um, so that is uh, an idea we have out here as option three, which could be combined with option one or two if this is of interest to the commission. And then the last option is um, returning to a process that's more similar to the prior ARC and site committee process, where there would be a committee um, consisting of city staff as well as two design professionals. This would be a city committee that would meet uh, subject to the Brown Act, so they'd be noticing um, uh, and other requirements uh, that would be necessary in order for those meetings to occur. Uh, one possibility is to sort of clear, more clearly define the scope of review of this committee. One of the concerns that was previously expressed by some planning commissioners is that historically there have been times when the Arkansas Committee had members with a particular of architectural preference um, that might be imposed um, on an applicant in a way that didn't um, really reflect underlying city policy. So one way potentially to address that is to um, uh, sort of limit the scope of the review of the uh, committee, um, focusing on project conformance with objective standards, um, issues of concern raised by city staff or the applicant, or um, higher level site layout and building massing considerations and not so much on uh, architectural style and um, exterior materials and colors and things like that being sort of explicitly off the table for discussion is um, I've seen that in some other cities as a way to um, sort of uh, focus the design review committee on sort of the most basic issues and less um, consideration of design details. Okay, so that's the. Oops. There we go. So those are the four options that we have been talking about and presenting to you tonight for your consideration. Um, I understand that there may be a uh, design professionals uh, at the meeting tonight to provide additional input, but what we're looking for is. A planning Commission feedback on whether or not any of these options are your preferred options or if you have other ideas that you would like us to incorporate in any amendments that we would take back to you. Are we going to hear from the design professionals? Tonight? Yeah, I think it would be appropriate to open the public hearing on this item and then Yes, yeah. I, I thought Go Derek ahead. was going to stick around, but I guess he didn't. Hi, everybody. My name is Bill Kemp. I'm an architect in uh, Santa Cruz. I was a resident of the city back in the 90s. 
And um, I've been working as an architect in Santa Cruz County for almost 30 years. Um, I've always felt that um, Capitola has more review than any place else in the county, um, especially for single family residential. And I've always felt that um, it kind of hindered the creativity of the professionals and that the city was sticking their nose into design concerns more than any place else that I was dealing with in the county. And I felt like Arkansas, while helpful on some of the some of the issues regarding utilities and drainage and slope issues and stuff like that, where they really kind of started to stick their nose into design issues, really kind of turned me off from doing work in, in the city. And um, so of the four options that were just presented, and I did fill out the survey, but I did it today because I was on vacation. So sorry about that. <laughs> so I have, a, I have some familiarity with, with what's going on. Um, and I also was here because I had a project on your consent agenda. But uh, I think option one is what's more prevalent um, in most jurisdictions where the architects work with city staff. And the, the, the city zoning ordinance is more geared towards a um, objective standards rather than these kind of particular design issues. I mean, I can remember having a project in the early 2000s where I had to come and and spend months just trying to get a window, a, dish, a window placed in a certain way in an addition to a, a existing home. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. I mean, to have to go through this and try and explain it to your your client. And, and I just, it just really turned me off on the whole process. Um, it's been helpful in some of the commercial stuff. I've since 2008. I've I've pushed my my um, my practice more into commercial work and multifamily. Um, but I just I just think that staff has the knowledge and the expertise to work with the architects and designers, especially on single family homes, to to let them explore their creativity. And that's that's really all I. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak to this? If it's appropriate, I could chime in on a conversation I had with Derek Van Alstein about um, he kind of, he his feedback was, Katie, it's a mixed bag. It's 50-50. He's had some really good experiences, and he's also had experiences in which um, there was almost no design feedback from the architect in the room. So he said over the years, it really has fluctuated and just said, you know, it's really a 50-50 roll of the dice of whether or not it'll enhance the, the review process. So that, that is what he had told me earlier tonight when I told him we'd be talking about this. So. Yes. Close the public, did we close the public hearing? Yeah, so seeing nobody else wanting to come up, we're going to close the public hearing and bring it back to you. Commission deliberations, what would you like to start, Susan? Um, well, I, I agree with some of Derek's comments. I think a lot of this whole process depends on who's doing it. Um, uh, you know, I personally spent about 20 years dealing with the Arkansas Committee, and sometimes we had architects and landscape architects who were wonderful, who were very helpful to the applicants in the community, and sometimes we didn't. Um, you know, and uh, my recollection is that the real impetus to get rid of the Arkansas Committee was that the city was asking the architect and landscape architect to be volunteers, and there really wasn't people who were interested in, you know, volunteering that much time to be involved in it. Um, and one of my um, 
main concerns is that um, I think we've somehow fallen down on the uh, public and the neighbors knowing what's going on when a project's being developed. Because we do want to hear from people early in the process. So if there are neighborhood issues or if there are design issues, they can be addressed before someone has spent thousands and thousands of dollars to go through engineering and develop plans. Uh, you know, it's better to catch it early in the process. So for me, I think I would go with option two, which, um, uh, you know, keeps in place what we have right now. Uh, but it does give the staff the opportunity because sometimes you have an architect, you have an owner, you have someone who is just, impossible to work with. I mean, they're very difficult. They've bought plans out of some catalog, and this is what they're going to build regardless of what anyone says. So having a safety valve in there where if we do have a, um, a you know, single-family home that's particularly difficult, that staff has some option to get some professional help to help them in, in option number two. Uh, I also think that as part of this, we need to develop a procedure that when we receive an application and the staff has deemed that it's complete, that we put up some sort of notice where the project is going to be. And I think it needs to be a bit larger than a standard green size piece of paper so that the people around it and the neighbors know in the very early stage that this is going on. So if they have concerns, um, if they have in, um, you know, I think the way it's set up right now, they would not have the opportunity to attend this meeting um, that staff has with the applicant. Is that correct? It's a, it's a closed meeting, so they would, but you know, perhaps, um, you know, make it possible that they can at least uh, attend or submit comments in writing. So the issues that are going to come up, come up early. That's, that's my goal in this. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think we need to individually design every new single family house that comes into Capitola. And I think there's room for lots of flexibility. But I, I want a process that uh, works well for the applicant and also works well for the community because, you know, more and more you hear, well, I, I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know that was going on uh, kind of thing, and that would eliminate some of that. So those are my starting comments. So can I can ask a question mm -hmm. about, so I kind of parrot this back. So what you're saying is that um, when we have the staff review, which is before, or obviously before it comes to this committee, mm -hmm. that you would post, uh, you would post to the neighborhood or, and at that time so they could attend or at least make comments to the staff. So what would be the, the timing of that? Is, does that occur months before the actual, where we post it now? Yes. There are other communities that do that. Um, City of Berkeley, um, will require a posting of submitted application. For example, if you've been there, you might have seen those really large yellow signs. Um, and there are other communities. The mission does. And there, there are other communities that have you know, notice of pending application once right. the application is deemed complete, yeah. for example. So there are examples out there for that sort of thing. That was something that I, I thought would be really, I mean, the whole, the relevance of of noticing, uh, or just the Park and Site Committee seemed to address community concerns. Not, I mean, the applicant process is um, important, but just having that time period to reflect on each project, and then having the, the community be able to, you know, have, the, you know, on their morning walks they see, you know, pending application, laminated 
sheet like the city of Santa Cruz or the county of Santa Cruz does. It, it just seems to be um, a good idea. Because how many times have we heard we didn't get the notice, you know, and it just seems like what well, was posted on the site in two separate places. So my question to you, mm -hmm. Christensen, would be as an architect, would you be in favor of an option four where you have uh, an, an out external professional landscape architect and um, a pro professional building architect review your work, or do you tend to lean towards what the was Mr. Kemp? Um, I, I've experienced both ways. So I, when I first started working with the city, we we had went through the Arkansas Committee for all um, design applications, and it was a great experience. We went. I think it was Frank Fanton that headed that committee at the time, and it was. I mean, I had a. I really enjoyed having all of his descriptions, and then Public Works would join in, and everybody put in their two cents. And that was included in our uh, staff report. So coming into the planning commission meeting, there was a lot of explanation as to where we started, where we went, and how we solved a couple problems that were presented at a more granular level that wouldn't necessarily or could maybe be over, you know, skipped over during planning commission. I thought that that was a, an, a, a good application of a small committee. But like Derek Van Alstein, what Katie was saying is that sometimes, you know, it was a mixed bag of maybe you didn't get that feedback at that time, and it was maybe a prolonged experience that wasn't as. Um, but I think there's a way to do it that would eliminate that 50 50 bag. <laughs> and we could have a really efficient, nice system that would give you a summary that, as a, as a non professional, as somebody that doesn't participate in architecture as a profession, you would have that really laid out for you. And, you know, as a planning commissioner. It sounds like then if you, if you went with option two, which is the staff has the option to bring it in, if it's, if it's just, you know, pretty almost a consent item, you say, okay, maybe we don't need Arkansas, Arkansas review, but if you have something that the staff is concerned about, you, per, you know, mm -hmm. what uh, Commissioner Westman was talking about, someone gets a catalog thing or whatever, then, you know. Who determines that? That that's kind of the thing of what determines if it's problematic or not. Staff, you know? right? But I mean, if there's an architect pre preparing a staff report, I mean, a preparing a, um, a schematic design set for planning commission, that's great. Like every set that Mr. Kemp could produce would probably be wonderful, and very complete. But um, somebody that necessarily doesn't, you know, they want to produce, that you know, they want to build their own home, it could not be as complete, which we've seen in the past, where it's just kind of a hand-drawn schematic set, and that doesn't seem like a, a ready and complete application. Right. The elephant in the room for me is if you go to option four, are, is the city prepared to pay to okay. have those professionals there? Because it, it really, there were, there were times when it was impossible to find someone who was good, who was willing to volunteer their time to do it. And, you know, my question would also be like an option two, if we go that route and it, it, we decide that we need a professional, who's paying for that? Is the city going to pay for it or are we adding an additional expense to the applicant? So I, I think that would go back to the applicant. Um, I don't think that could come out of our general fund. It would be a cost that would go back to the applicant. So if we were to send it out for a special third-party review or have on-call or consite committee members, um, then that were paid, that would definitely come out of the application fees. So the design, design permit would become more expensive. So does that become open-ended? It does become open-ended. So the applicant has no clue what they're going to pay for a fee when they submit their plan. Because you could have an architect come in and that architect might say, well, it's going to take me 10 hours to review this stuff. I'm going to charge you 350 bucks an hour, bingo, another 3,000 bucks for my fee. Right. Um, we, could, we could set it up that we have a contract with an architectural firm and, or with the, you know, with the professionals and, have, and know that cost ahead of time so there's no surprises. 
And we already do this. And right? it's commercial, right? I mean, yeah, for commercial, we do this. And that is depending on the project. So when we have a really large project, um, we'll get a, a fee, we'll, we'll get a, an estimated cost from a design professional, and then we'll go through the process with a contract. But this, if, if we were to require this of every design permit, that goes to planning commission, then we would definitely add the fee for a design permit would go up to reflect that additional cost of that meeting. Would it be just a stipend based on the 30 minutes that is the, the like kind of how planning commission works where, you know, you don't necessarily pay them prevailing wage, you're paying them like a stipend for, you know, services rendered for that package of monthly I mean, I'm just hypothetically speaking. <laughs> yeah, I think if it's a um, Brown Act meeting and it's an architectural site review committee, it would be similar to planning commission or city council in that respect of a stipend. Um, I think, and if we were to go that route, we'd, we'd want to be clear about do we still want to utilize a contract service for the larger project? Um, so, um, just a personal experience, I've been through the process, um, you know, it's been 10 years. I thought it was great, it was very beneficial going through it personally of having a third, uh, you know, having the committee provide feedback. Um, I also think, you know, um, for sitting as commissioner for the last, you know, coming up a year and a half, you know, we had to have issues that come to us and we, were, we feel, I feel awkward in some of the positions that we're talking about, window locations and stuff like that. And if we start to make decisions that a window can't be in a certain location, you know, the cost at that time for that window change could be a ton if I had to go back to the structural. So I think it would be a positive to have this. Um, I think two, uh, uh, the suggestion or option number four takes it a little bit too far. Um, I think option two, I am in favor of, um, I would like to um, see what one of the commissioners thought about, you know, maybe um, any new residential project. You know, um, it seems like everybody comes here um, to any time there is a new project, there's lots of concerns about the aesthetic value and all the stuff. And I think a lot of those things can be worked through at a different level. I think it'd be beneficial as a commissioner too to have a report that was generated from that, um, that review that was done. And so we had some background and some input maybe at that time, you know, we could expand on why, you know, we like to see pitch roofs in Capitola or not, and there's some uh, feedback and give and take. And so um, I'd be more in favor, like option two, with um, giving staff some flexibility on s smaller reviews and stuff like that, but on a new project, a new residential project, that it would go through that. And I would think a, an applicant going through the process of building a brand new home, this would not be detrimental to their project, and if the, especially if the fees were established up front on what that review process would look like for a new residential project. And I am in favor of some sort of posting of a sign um, as soon as possible, wherever that would be. And so if there was agreement to go to some architectural review, that that's when the sign would be posted, and that sign would stay up through the process all the way to planning, and so that, that would help alleviate those concerns. So you're, you're posing a Modified option two, where the criteria for having that extra review is predetermined um, on any on on a new residential, brand new of construction. So, the El Salto the thing we just looked at would that require this review or not? No, that is it's because the existing house and staff. I would think the staff could re have a review, but a new house like the one at Famwire that we just looked at, um, you know, when it's complete knockdown in a brand new house, that it would go through that process. And I think you're, an applicant would be, you know, they're in the mindset they're... So they know what they're getting into when they start it. And if it was up front and everything like that, I mean, you know, let's face it, they're knocking over a house going through the whole process. Yeah. That's what my thoughts were. Yeah, um, I think I agree with everything that Susan said. And, and I think... Oh my gosh, the <laughs> meeting's over. <laughs> I don't mean Never to cause again. you to faint. Um, um, and with regards to the, um, your issue, um, I, I think that could be a, just part of what staff has in the back of their mind. Like, for example, if, if, if 
someone comes up with like just a you know eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper. Here's my design. And they say, uh, well, I'm sorry, this has to you know go through a review. You know, and this, and similar if it's a brand new net, brand new house, they say, well, this is this is pretty big impact to this neighborhood. You're going with a whole different flavor, this or that. I think we need to have you know an external review. So I, I think we can. I think that we can rely on staff to use their best judgment on this kind of thing. My only comment re regarding it would be um, what what project gets, uh, you know, so somebody's building a new house and it's a little more challenging. I mean, with easements and setbacks, you know, does somebody feel that they're being treated different? They have to go through the process. Or if there's a modification to that, does the applicant have an off maybe they want to go through the process to have that feedback or you know maybe they might want to volunteer which is number three yeah i don't think we should provide free services to applicants which would be a free architect review of just because they request it no i meant number three they'd be they'd be paying for it because they might want to go through the process because if they, i think if they understood the process and it could be beneficial to them it, it could save them a lot of money other than designing their whole house and then getting to ah so you're saying that you have an architect maybe he's an ex maybe he's a san francisco architect comes in has this beautiful house and you're saying well, wait a minute this is capitola let's have a local architect capitola architect or someone who knows the city better i'm willing to pay for that review you know let's do that and this would be the form for that right i i, I mean i don't even think we need to add that in, I think if someone came in and asked staff to, you know, said we would like to have our project reviewed by, you know, a local professional, can you arrange that? They certainly could do that. I mean, I, I can't really imagine somebody doing that, but if they wanted to, I think they, that wouldn't be a problem. So taking, uh, I guess, more question to get back for staff. And the projects that you see come in, how many of these would you see that would be something potentially, you know, if you just look, take a snapshot of the projects in the last year, how many of these would you think that would go through this process, would you think? Other than so, staff feeling confident that, oh, these are in line with how we think and there won't be. That's a great question. So I think the option two is very subjective and we're trying to become more objective, right, within our planning process. So, you know, we've had a couple projects that have come in where um, we've given quite a bit of design feedback related to the design guidelines that this process would be helpful, but it, it also um, kind of puts staff in a predicament of um, if you have a design professional come in and we were to say, so we're going to take you through this extra step. And we do have really good relationships, I think, within with with the design community here in Capitola. And so I think I I was actually really um, supportive of where you were going with a new single family home, and it could be something like a new single family home or second story. But having more objective standards so that um, one we we're not picking on design professionals, and two when we get to planning commission, if it's a project you don't like. I would hate to get the question of, well, staff, why didn't this go, why wasn't this a concern? Why didn't you send it out? So I do think we have to keep this objective. So you're saying you would like us to say new homes are remodels where that are bigger than 80% of the structure. And I don't know if 80% is the right, or 80% of the structures being. I think one of the criteria get used a lot in construction is once it crosses the threshold of 50%, a lot of times fire sprinklers get automatically kicked into the project because they look at the whole project's changing. So that's one of the percentage numbers I think that is common in the industry at 50%. And so one of the notes I made was like a project over 50% or a new construction project. Um, and I was just concerned about people being thought they might be treated different in the process. Can I add just something really Absolutely. I, I think. For example, the, the, the house, the, the project across the street, and I'm not trying to pick on this one, but I think it was 417. Mm -hmm. um, they had a design feature on their house that 
It was a mansard roof on the rear side, and that was light, you know, as explained in the staff report and everything. But I feel like if, if somebody didn't have any background in why that was there and how it could, I mean, this is where I kind of find I'm not trying to, to sidestep the design professional role. I just feel like the community needs to be spoon fed sometimes what these design features are and how they can be summarized in a staff report because the city staff does a great job doing that. But understanding like why that roof is there, it, it was a, um, uh, I think it was a sight line or I can't remember what the reason why they put the mansard roof, but it was unnecessary in, in terms of, you know, visual appearance <laughs> and it could be omitted. And unless somebody says, you know, I don't necessarily think that's a, a good thing, it, it, it would be it would be built, you know. So I kind of feel like having that type of articulate nature to a staff report is important, and and that's that's why I lean towards having an Arkansite because then they somebody would pick that out and say, this is I don't know if this is necessary. But then on the other hand, it does prolong the planning experience, and it plan you know it prolongs uh, the applicants finances and everything. I mean, they're paying a mortgage, <laughs> I'm sure, while they're doing the project. So um, I just feel like to kind of double back, having the having the signage on the street, having commu more community involvement to then spoon feed them <laughs> what exactly this design is for single family residential and for, um, you know, 80% or a significant sing uh, project would be useful. Is that kind of clear? Am I skipping over? <laughs> so so are, oh, you, are, you, are you stating a threshold of? Well, what they were just saying, saying if for any new large project. I think she's saying she agrees with yeah. uh, new, having um, a, an objective standard, any new single family residence or a remodel that um, involves more than, you know, 50% of the structure. So I disagree with the threshold idea. Okay, it's just, I, it's just kind of and, and, and I think the reason is, is because now you're, you're automatically putting in it at added expense, automatically putting in more time delay, um, not sure what you're going to get. It could be an, a, one of the bad architects, you know, that, that, that just says, oh, I don't like that particular design. And so we, we kind of fall back into the, all the objections of option four. The reason I liked option two is it, it did give staff some flexibility, but to your point, it also gives you it maybe <laughs> in a, in a, paints you in a corner, so to speak. So that, t that, that I think we agreed we wanted option two. Um, Until Katie spoke. <laughs> No, no, what Katie said was that she wanted us to come up with an objective standard so it wasn't a subjective choice that staff had to make. They had some guidelines to base their reasoning on. Uh, I, yeah. Those, though, unless we want to create a threshold. And I feel like um, just to go, like, again, to just um, restate, you know, when a, when a project does hit a 50 cent threshold, there is a major change in that project. I mean, fire sprinklers, that's, you're completely getting inside the house to put in a fire sprinkler. You're upgrading water service. That project won't be habitable, I mean, for the time during the construction. So there's, it's a whole different project when it hits. So all those items are in the code, right? When you have major redesign, you have to meet all the code items, building, building items, whatever we have in terms of setbacks and heights and all, I mean, there's a lot of requirements we, we have to meet, right? And so all of that stuff is very objective as opposed to a subjective Arkansas view. I just look at this opportunity to um, have review done and the, the, especially the community being notified about a project that's going to have substantial impact and having a, a threshold or a subjective measure of when does that happen. And that's why I think, too, I think two is the right format, and I think how we can get to a part of what, when does two become not a staff decision, it become um, an, an automatic so an applicant knows, I'm, I'm putting in fire sprinkler, I'm going to 50%, if that's the number, that's, and it kicks in this. And so it's kind of 
um, I think those are kind of automatic uh, steps. And if it wasn't that, it'd be, you know, a new construction item because it's a brand new house. That was my comment. So it seems like we need to hear from Paul and then we'll sort of know. Well, I mean, we have to build an additional 1,300 dwelling units in the next six years. So everything, every impediment we throw in front of architects and potential developers and families is going to slow that down. So I'm, I'm not, I, I, my experience with the Arkansas Review, which I did twice, once with a San Francisco architect, by the way, um, was miserable. Um, because we didn't get any feedback that I considered or the architect considered useful. Now, I think that's what uh, Derek Van Alstine is saying. It depends on who shows up that day and what kind of mood they're in, right? And if they're not getting paid, they're probably not in a very good mood. <laughs> so, I, although I, I, I do agree with Commissioner Jensen that, or, and Westman that we should try to do something for these projects of concern. I, I'm with you, though, Peter. It's like, is it 50%? Is it 80%? How do you... Rather, you know, how do you make an objective standard to have an objective review? I think we should let our professional staff figure out what needs review and doesn't need review, what's mundane and what's not, and you know, see if it works. If it doesn't work, we can change the process. And we should definitely do the Berkeley City sign thing as early in the process as we can. Thank so you. One comment complete. I would have if we go to where we have a contract. We am understanding it with option two. The city would enter into some sort of contract with an architect to fulfill that function, and they would be paid for it. So it's different than the old Arkansas where the person was a volunteer. And since there's going to be that contract, there's an opportunity to, you know, get a request for proposal from some architects and interview them and, you know, pick someone who people feel um, can work with the community and the applicants and the other architects. It's not like you just, at one point, you just had to take anybody who would volunteer because there was no one else. And we would be eliminating that. It's the luck of the draw who you get. In we already have a pool of architects to do the commercial and multifamily units. Mm -hmm. right? We we typically we um we put out an RFQ and we had a few responses and then one dropped out of the pool. So now we're, we've got RRM who does all of our reviews. Yep. So in terms of timing with option two, another thing. So personally, I think the design review committee option four might even be faster. Just because it's it's set up that we meet twice a month. Um, if if we were to send projects out for a third party review, people are busy, and these you know these firms are busy. I think our typical turnaround for the larger commercial projects is like three to five weeks, probably, to get comments back from an RRM. So, just just thinking about that, like once we have a project that complies with all of our development standards or if they've applied for a variance, we, we get it on that ARC and site meeting to get the comments from the other um, departments. So we've been trying to internally improve this process over the last year, uh, knowing it's been a concern. But um, I think in terms of like review start to finish, option four would almost be the fastest. Yeah, I was looking at just um, two would be almost, it would be every project and I was looking for to try to alleviate the some projects wouldn't get to that point, so they all had to go to option four, you know, and so that, that's all I was trying to streamline. I thought, I appreciate you saying if it's just automatically everything go, I was trying to look at streamlining for the applicant that some wouldn't have to go there, and if there was a, whatever that number was or standard was, they could just be fast-tracked, and then there was a number that it went to or a new project, you go to that, and it's already scheduled and everything else. to clarify option four the focus design committee is with staff the outside local architect or somebody and that happens at one time before planning commission is that just to clarify for option two or option four 
Option four would be it would be included within the normal design review committee that we currently have. Okay. So that would, you're saying that that would be the most expeditious. <laughs> that would, because it's it's every two weeks. Everybody's in the it's same already room. scheduled, and it would just mean that we'd have a couple more committee members, and it would be a Brown Act uh, meeting, so we would have a public notice for it. back on um, we just went through the housing element and and they say let's objective standards objective standards objective standards so now we're saying oh no but we want to have this Arkansas committee which is going to have an opinion on a mansard roof or it's like if we can't make objective standards we're not meeting the spirit of what the state wants us to do even I know we don't agree with what the state wants to do most of the time but that's fine uh, and, and so, but I'm taking that, I take that to heart. It's like, let's, you know, objective standards. And so to me, I'm, I'm leaning more towards option one, where you have an enhanced staff view. They know the code. Here are the standards. Here's what we need to do. And, if, and we put them on the spot to say, okay, now, based on some criteria, we're going to have a review with architects. It's a, it's a slippery slope. I, 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 it doesn't sound that workable. Having, having walked through it a little bit. Yeah. Now that we've talked about it, you're right. I mean, it seems option one, you know, what are we trying to fix on option from option one? What's the problem we're trying to solve? We're, we're saying option one is not working properly. Uh, just listening in, I'm, I'm trying to distill a few themes that I'm hearing, and I'm actually hearing some things that I want to run by you that uh, what the, one of the most consistent things I think we're hearing, which is maybe a little outside of the design review aspect of it, um, but we're, we're hearing we'd like to find ways to let the public know a little earlier whether or not that's to uh, see if they want to or, or uh, have input they want to give into that process or attend a meeting or just to lessen the sort of shock factor of some I found out after something was decided. Um, that seems to be pretty consistent that we're hearing. The other part is, um, and I, I think uh, Chair Christensen really gave me this this thought, which is we're hearing perhaps more, uh, a desire for more design narrative. So not necessarily something that looks at uh, the standards and isn't necessarily something that is prescribed specifically, but something that helps explain why decisions were made in the design maybe whether it was by a recommendation by staff or simply a necessity by design that the architect designer came up with, like the, the uh, slope back or side roof. Um, and then lastly, and this ties into that, that other point, which is uh, I think what we're also feeling here, um, regardless of, of, of the incorporation of, of outside input, is um, perhaps a desire to, to see more of our uh, overarching design review criteria transition into uh, more objective review criteria, which is typically when, when staff has been looking at them, that is the lens that we try to go through is something that is more objective. Um, some of those criteria can be uh, more difficult to parse in, in, a way, in that way, um, and perhaps that's a, another uh, theme that we're hearing. So I'd love to hear what, what you think about those thoughts. What's the, um, it, just at option, at option four, if it went to an applicant, it'd be adding maybe approximately two weeks to their time, and would there an additional cost of having a consultant attend that meeting, correct? So for option four. Um, I'm just trying to understand the magnitude of the change. Yeah, the magnitude of the change is that uh, we would, we, we pretty much draft a short, memo to our Arkansas committee and its internal staff. So it just highlights, it's, it's what you see in your staff report in terms of the development criteria of setbacks, height, and those things. Um, so we'd be having to get that out in advance to design professionals. Like as soon as an application comes in, we circulate it through the other departments. We wouldn't send it to the design professional until we knew it complied with code. So it, it's adding that little bit of time of, um, We've got to draft that memo to do the analysis on it, make sure it complies, and then we would send it off to the design professional. I, so 
what we're here tonight to do is to give you direction because you're going to go back and write up an ordinance that's going to come back to us to review on this topic, right? Yeah. So um, uh, it, it seems like, um, I think that um, John did have some, some good points. One of our main concerns is uh, the public and how the public's informed so people in the neighborhood know what's going on and can participate in that process. So that can happen no matter what option we pick. Um, and if we um, stick with option one, uh, you know, the enhanced staff review, but add the sort of noticing piece in there, uh, that would give us an opportunity to see if that would be enough to sort of get to where we want to be. Um, and maybe just to be on the safe side, you could, you know, give some thoughts to, you know, I just, you know, it seems like we need to come to a consensus about where we want to go because we're really just giving direction at this point. I think Sean's third point too, which uh, hit on Commissioner Estes' point of like, what are we really trying to change about the process? And we could look at our design review criteria and try to make them more objective. I think that's that, that's something that we list within our housing elements. We need to relook at that anyway, but that could make the process better and, and trying to utilize a vocabulary within that design review criteria that really speaks to the architects and they understand what's expected of a single family home and a single family development in Capitola. That type of, right? Like the social front yard, the thing, you know, the. All the ideas we've talked about in the past of being environmentally friendly and privacy, but maybe elaborating more on those items so there's no surprises. But that would give them some direction and it's going to come back to us for another whole hearing. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that the, the objective standards we have now are significantly better than what we had 10 years ago. I mean, it's a lot easier to understand what you've got to do now mm -hmm. you're going into the design of a new single family home. Yeah. So if you could enhance it, I'd, I'd be all for that. I'm not sure exactly what more you'd have to do. I think it's truly objective. Massing, there's no way we're going to get an objective standard for massing. Okay. That's actually a great example. That was when that application came in on the cathedral like building. Right. That would it be useful to have somebody comment? Or have some type of like the enhanced, or a, maybe a, a combination between one and four, of having some type of representation, a comment, subjectively. Comment. <laughs> I know, but just subjective. but it, they don't have to. She doesn't. I mean, the the applicant didn't have to adhere to those comments. They're subjective, but they have to. They're allowing the public to acknowledge that there was a comment on the massing just like you brought up. But if you didn't bring that up, it would just kind of go through, you know? I, I'm just, maybe just. So can I, I'm a little out of order here, but I noticed there's an architect at the back of the room that maybe came in oh. late. Um, I don't know if there's. Can we allow her? I know we're past yeah. public comments, yeah. but. Would anybody else like to make a comment from the, uh, I'm looking at you, Dennis Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Not Josh. <laughs> Or it Bill, I mean, if you'd like to add anything else, I we all input. It's welcome. Let me go back and just say a little bit that Arkansas, when, for instance, when Frank was on this, um, he showed up at the meetings. He made comments on the project. Mm -hmm. Some of them were taken, some were not. Mm -hmm. But it, that doesn't slow the process down because you're going to have Arkansas already. Don't don't create another process in this. The people who are taking plans through the process now, you you have to be knowledgeable. Or you're not going to be up here doing it. It's too difficult a process without having some knowledge of the process, number one, and what and what's needed in the community. So I, I'd say if, if anything, go back to the old Arkansas site and get, get an architect to volunteer. You probably can. And just, just put them on the Arkansas site review and you get your comments at that point. It, it doesn't hold the applicant at all. And, uh, we, we don't need to create any more levels of government than we have right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
It is, anybody else have anything else to add? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Just wrap it up. Um, no, I mean, I, I agree with, with Dennis. I mean, we, we, are, we are burdened by process. I mean, this process takes an insane amount of time to get anything done. And um, if, you can, if you can get, I, I think there's a balance. I think you, you need to have objective standards. I don't think you should review everything. I think you are, you are under so much pressure now to build so much that any, anything you put as a barrier is going to, to not get you to your goals. And you're going to wind up with things you really don't want. And, and I know Capitola sees themselves as special. And I know you guys don't want to hear that. And you, but you do look at things in a different way than everybody else in the county. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I think the Arkansas State Committee can work. Um, I think having it on a two-week basis um, and always available just so things can happen quicker. I, I think that that's one thing, but I really think staff can handle most of it. And if the if the um, if you post it like you're speaking about, which I think is a good idea, and you get that input, oh, the neighbors are all upset about this. I think on that poster, it should actually have a a link to a city website that actually can show them where the plants are, so they don't even have to come and bother you. They can just go online, they can see see the plans themselves, come up with their own ideas, and say, okay, give your comments here. And then. If there's a free flow of information back to the architect, they can hear these concerns. But the thing is, last thing, is just that you guys are the decision makers. Everybody or an inordinate amount of people actually come before you to get their projects approved. Um, and so you've, you set the standard. And so that standard filters out into the community. People know what they have to do to get through you. So. In some ways, I think Arkansas could go away, but that's just my own thought. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Appreciate all of the feedback. Anybody else would like to say anything? Nope. I was going to, I'd like to mention one other item. I think it um, has been a great um, opportunity having a design professional on our planning commission with Courtney. And there's something we could look at our bylaws for the planning commission in general and make sure that we always have at least one design professional who, who's trained in architecture and plan, or planning on the planning commission to assist in that role too. Because um, just as a, another idea of another layer of having, making sure that there's design. Oh, okay. We did that in... Park City, but that's a whole nother state. So, okay. And that was extremely helpful to always have a design professional on our plan commission. Do you have a lot of the, I mean, do, do we want to go through and yeah, let's uh, summarize which, what, what advice we're giving? Does that sound like a good bookend? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just like one and three or one. <laughs> so I, I think that most of the things we've discussed that everybody agrees on aren't any of the options in terms of noticing and, and getting more more input on where the, the decisions came from and where these the, the design issues came from so that i agree with all of those things that sean mentioned and susan elaborated on and so that just leaves me back to option one where i am yeah i agree with peter i'm with option I'm at um, option four, um, and um, but also with the enhancement of having the signage added, you know, as automatically that. So um, looking at the process, and I, but I just wanted the qualifier to be a new house, you know, substantiate what the project is that would have to go through Arkansas site, you know, um, review would be a, a new project that would be a substantial impact to the neighborhood. Oh, this is a tough one. Me. But I think I, if if I have to choose between, uh, you know, one and four, I think I would go with four. I think I'm, I'm leaning that way. I, um, the most expeditious option of 
um, everybody in the same room at one time would, would be most attractive to me too in the process as option four. But I have to say that it's wonderful working with city staff on projects. So I think that what we're doing right now is great and any enhancement would be welcome. And also um, bringing in noticing at application completion would be great. Excellent. Um, to Jerry's point about uh, creating a threshold for single family, I think all projects that require a design review will go to Arkansite, so there's really not a need for a threshold if we go with option four. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Yep. Okay, um, so we should make a decision. We have three more items on the zoning code update, and Ben, how long do you think each item will take? I'm going to pull up that first or do you have questions on this the feedback no yeah okay because it is quarter of eight and we still have one more application so, um, the presentation can be uh, as short as the planning commission would like uh, the staff the staff report laid out the thinking um, there's maybe a few things in the presentation that weren't in the staff report but if the Planning Commission would like a very abbreviated staff presentation for each of these discussion topics, I can certainly do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would like a little discussion on the R1. I mean, I think, I think we agreed at our last meeting on the multifamily. We're willing to do density levels and all that stuff aside for the condo. Um, to just sort of go through the R1 stuff one more time. And how SB9 is going to work, I always get confused. So, um, it, we're, discussion topic one is focused just on the multifamily okay. RM. And yeah, the increase in height and yeah. okay. So, I'll, I'll do a very abbreviated presentation, um, starting with the density question. So um, here's the, the zoning map. The multifamily zones are in brown and include three subzones, RML, RMM, and RMH. Um, and the density of those is shown on the screen. So RML is 10, RMM is 15, and RMH is 20. And the housing element uh, calls for the city to review that and to consider uh, whether or not that's a uh, constraint on housing production and should be changed and increased. And so in the staff report, there were materials that were showing um, the built densities in Capitola, uh, some recent Santa Cruz development uh, up to three stories, Santa Cruz County development up to three stories, and then some um, prototypes looking at example densities. And I won't repeat that um, in terms of what the built densities are. Uh, and then I won't repeat this, um, but I will sort of pause here and uh, say that when considering uh, preferred densities, that there are a number of considerations for the Planning Commission, the built densities currently in the R zones, the desired multifamily housing types in Capitola, desired unit size, and thinking about where this development might occur as well as compatibility with surrounding areas. And um, this is a slide is a bit of a cheat sheet of these different densities. So when we're talking about 10 dwelling units, um, up to 10 dwelling units, that's more sort of detached single family home, small lot single family home or garden style apartments. Um, if you want townhomes or um, uh, multiple units on smaller lots, we're looking more at 20 dwelling units per acre for that. And once you get um, into stacked flats, uh, we're looking more at 30 dwelling units per acre and then um, uh, with smaller unit sizes, and maybe some structured parking for apartments or condos, we're looking more at 40 dwelling units per acre. So you know, I think what we're looking for tonight, uh, given what the existing densities are, does um, the Planning Commission have any feedback on whether or not those maximum densities should be increased? If so which subzones and by how much. And then that will then tell us what adjustments, uh, if any, are needed to the development standard so that those maximum densities can be achieved. Okay. 
So a comment, um, and this gets into the, the height requirement, correct? Yeah, so I, you know, I think that if, if, if you were to allow um, more density in the RML or RMM, you would probably want to increase the height a little bit. And so my only uh, concern was just, it, it looked like um, the recommendation was maybe going to from 30 to 35 feet, is that correct? Like I said, yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying as a, um, and I just think um, just going back to tying design um, down by having a certain height, um, you know, I would think that we should look at floor space, you know, so if you got to, if somebody wanted just to build uh, a building at 35 feet and so they wanted to go three floors at 11 feet and then go with a flat top roof, um, we could have that. And that's all based off just trying to provide more area space inside that room for who's ever living there. And, and that would kind of, I think, then discourage um, uniqueness of design if we talk about, sometimes we talk about pitch roofs or opportunities of having heights and stuff. So by maxing out the height of the building and then uh, an applicant design just wanted to design for maximum height inside the area, and then not worry about what the aesthetics were, I would just be concerned. And I don't know how to address those two things, but those are just concern I had on, on maximum height, or should we look at uh, you know, floor wall heights um, as maybe more of a deterring factor and then let them be creative on what the design and the outside of the roof could look like. Yeah, I, I think I would be in favor of something like we added in the village where there is some allowance for you know, you have a height, and then you have some allowance to encourage people not to do flat roof buildings. Um, you can build a huge wall. Yeah, just to build a huge wall. So, uh, you know, whatever we did, I would like there to be some allowance in there to encourage people, I mean, if it, even if it's three stories, to then um, have a big one. Uh, it doesn't mean they have to, but they have that mm -hmm. option if they want. Well, like the city of Santa Cruz measures from mid span to the ceiling. Right. I think that's I what we could have done. The village could have done. It's yeah. it's like middle point of the of the gable. It doesn't exceed the height of the of the bridge. <laughs> right. I think DJ come up came up with some sort of height norm that the sill height is or whatever the mm -hmm. top plane or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I I'm a little uh, confused. So. Um, SB, oh no, I guess it's the ADU requirements, SB9, we, even in R1, we'll end up with 35 BU per acre, right? I mean, so um, so that's that's not even in the multifamily, where the multifamily RML is 10, uh, MM is 15, RH is 20. All of those are less than the 35 BU per acre. Development units per acre, um, so they I guess they all need to be increased because you pointed out that there's tons of exceptions already. So my concern is, as I was driving around those neighborhoods and those little brown spots are just scattered all throughout the, to suddenly have three-story buildings popping up in the middle of this neighborhood and the middle of that neighborhood, it, it makes me think that the community maybe. Maybe this is one area where we have an community <laughs> outreach. Um, on the other hand, we're hands are tied, right? Because we have the housing element, we've agreed to these densities in this area. So I'm, you know, yeah. to what extent are we driven to go three stories versus maybe just, you know, have a more forgiveness on parking or more forgiveness on infill or setbacks or whatever? I would think that the the neighborhoods where and, and there are apartment buildings in these neighborhoods, but they're all, you know, two stories. And with the exception along the coast, I guess there's a three-story one. So I, I would think that those those neighbors and those neighborhoods would want to keep that height if they could. But I don't have a good feel of, to what extent the housing element and our density requirements really drive us to three stories and how much forgiveness we have there. Well, I think we're, we're jumping the gun. The, the <laughs> question is being put in front of us is do we want to increase the densities from the 10, 15, 20 to something higher? Right. Since we have 
a number of examples already in the community where it's higher, and we have a housing element which is we don't comply, we'll eventually start taking money out of our coffers, right? Um, and if we don't get past that wicket, and then you know we have we have a housing crisis. We have people that can't afford to live. Most people can't afford to live in Capitola. Um, you know, and a lot of the people that work here cannot live in Capitola because it's just too too expensive. So if we don't entice developers to build stuff that's reasonably affordable, we're going to have, we're going to just perpetuate this situation. So I think we should, personally, I think we should just double every, both of, all of these three uh, levels from 10 to 20, 15 to 30, 20 to 40. Well, I went 20, 40, 60, but, but, but again, my concern was that having driven around and like, I can't you see a, a, a developer just dropping what, you know, there's a couple of houses that come up for sale and he decides, oh, I'm going to put a big, and I, I just hate to go down that path. I mean, it seems to me it should be more, well, more planned. Well, I think for me, I certainly know that the low density needs to go up. Um, I mean, the low, low density residential zoning is, it's really low. And so, um, I mean, if we could sort of take them one at a time. So I absolutely, in the low density, could go along with... Um, the suggestion to double the density from 10 to 20. I agree. It doesn't, it, it, by the way, there are multiple variables here. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to increase the height. Right. Well, that, that's, so, that's, that's, my, that's my dilemma. So that's what I'm trying to struggle with. We're going to tell him what we think the density ought to be, and then he's going to come back and say, this is what you have to allow to get that density in that area. You know, you're going to have to allow buildings to be 35 feet, right? Yeah, the height is actually the next topic. Okay. And, and the development standards, so this is just about density. Um, and so within those three, the uh, low, medium, and high, what, what would be, it might be helpful to go back to the picture of the four densities. And so for low, what I'm hearing is the top right, the max of 20 dwelling units per acre. And then if, if you'd like the medium to be at 30 and the max at 40, you know, we can develop standards for that. And I think the three stories comes into play with that max at 40. But with that connected from, from a density to go to the height, that was just my concern was, um, you know, at 35 feet, and if there's no design, you could have somebody have 12 foot high ceilings. And if we're talking about housing needs and people living here, you know, then we're having massive tall buildings built in our neighborhoods because the developer of that project decided they wanted to have 12 foot high ceilings at, at three different levels. Um, so, to trying to control that a little bit to identify, we understand there's a housing need, housing shortage. Um, and we want to have affordable housing at the same time, but then not affect the overall uh, massing, if you want to call it that, of a neighborhood. That was all my comment was. My concern is 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 at the high end. So we have the the Balboa project, right? Which and we we've talked about that area and how we really wanted to increase that density. We you know, so in the RM high. It's like, well, okay, maybe we want four or five stories in these very specific locations um, because they're zoned for it. So you know, um, I'm thinking the max 40 for the RMH is too low. So I'll, I'll also... Um, Remember that like on the mall and in those places where we're talking about building housing, they're not zoned RMH. It's that we allow housing to be developed in our commercial area. We're just talking with this about the ones that are shown on the map as being designated as multifamily. Yeah, I know. And, and there's a specific area off a of park, right, the Balboa area, where where we had, we looked at that when we were looking at the housing element and said, well, this is an area where it's already dense. We're already three stories. It's like, well, this seems to be an area where if we're going to tear this down in development, let's really... You know, let's let's get our thirteen hundred in right in here, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that if we, if we max it out at, at forty du per acre, that that won't get us there. 
So that the property you're speaking of is 600 Park, and some of the direction we could take from this evening's conversation is that that should be rezoned because we actually kept that out of the housing element because at the current zoning that it is at uh, and going through our evaluation, a, a developer most likely, if they're trying to make if they're for profit, will not choose that site um, because it already has a, pr a profit from the existing homes that are on there. And what Veronica Tam was suggesting is you'd have to put three times the amount of density to uh, coop your your investment back, but um, not it, for a nonprofit, it's different dynamics. So I would love to see a project there that came in with a nonprofit, but that that's one site that um, right now, uh, do you know that the, the part of that, gets that into the whole state laws about they have to replace all the low income units that are yeah. there now? And I mean, there, all of that. There's yeah. a whole list of things that impact the mm -hmm. financial feasibility of that property compared to a lot of other. Yes, so under our current housing element, there's a lot more opportunity along the 41st Avenue corridor, up to 50 feet for the um, incentivized area, 75 feet on the mall, and then this would be just pure residential, not mixed use, this discussion. Okay, so you're saying that um, if we were to really want to do the high density like I noticed, maybe you put the map back up there. None of the brown areas are on Long Forty, right on Forty First. That's a special zone, right? Mm -hmm. Where's Forty First on there? Is it red? The red and the yeah. Pink. So, so you're saying that that's where we have the really high density is in the red, red zone and the RH. Let's see, where is that? Yeah, oh. I was looking along Park Avenue there. Yeah, right? along Park, and then the two condos along the water, on the other end of. Capitola. Right. And so when, when I was up looking around Hill Avenue up in the, the middle of the map there, that's where I was concerned about we, we didn't want to get, you know, that's going to be too dense. You start putting three, four story buildings in that area. That would really, I think, disrupt the neighborhood. Is there a way to, like, um, the mall people came in and asked to, I don't mean to call them the mall people, but they came in and asked for increased height and density in, in in taking each project case by case is that an option is that not is that kind of bogus to just have you know have some discretion they come in and they you know we have a certain density outlined for that zone and they ask for increase no well, we've already given acceptance to the mall property well, i'm just saying if a future project were to come in is it a state density bonus law where they could ask for concessions and waivers if they include affordable housing. Right. So um, we, so for the medium density, right now it's 15 dwelling units per acre. So if, if we were to talk about the neighborhood um, by Hill um, and behind Gales, mm -hmm. is that an area that you could see going up to 20? dwelling units per acre of, and, and then if we could go at 20 it's dwelling at units, right oh, it's, at, it's at 15 right now. So we were just saying for the low density to go up to 20. Go to 20. So I could go to 25 on the medium density, you know, add 10 more units per acre, and on the high density, add 10 more units per acre. 20, 30, and So um, could you go back, because you, you showed some examples of where we're taking exception. So aren't there some RMM and RMHs where we're already over 30 and 40? Like Penn Avenue and Gales is 37.4. So wouldn't we want to at least increase this to cover what's already been built? I think we're so. We're talking about density now, not height. I'm talking, yeah, aren't you talking about density, 37? Dwelling units per acre. Yeah. On uh, 501 Plum is 37.6 dwelling units per acre. Mm -hmm. And that's RMM? Yep. 
So we could do two things, and we could make the density suggestions, and also there could be a request from the Planning Commission for like any that are non-conforming to put them in the correct density category, such as the Plum Street, like bumping that up to high density to be in compliance. I actually think that would be nice for them, for us to do that, because being out of conformance creates some issues for them trying to refinance it, improve it, and do that. So I like the idea of the ones that are existing that are there, that they get an opportunity for us to give them zoning that puts them in conformance. Mm -hmm. Every parcel is going to have its own zone. Mm, yeah, and we can't <laughs> talk to them, so it might be different. So, so again, so I would think that because we have, well, there it is, the 501 Plum, 37.6. So I would think because we've set that precedent that we should at a minimum just say, okay, that's the new density that we've established. You know, it's 37.6, you know, for RMM. And then we just keep round down to <laughs> gotta be, you know, I think we should simplify it and, and incorporate what we've already approved or someone has approved and just say that's that's the new that's the new standard. It's the new density standard. So all your suggestion of twenty forty no twenty what did you say? Twenty forty six forty I was doing twenty fifth twenty thirty forty. Is that what you say? But that thirty would not be sufficient for um Yeah, that's why that's why I went. 20, 40, 60 initially, but maybe 60 is a little bit aggressive. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we could say 20, 20, 35, 40, and 35 is is close enough to rounding error for to, to incorporate the 37.5. <laughs> I could agree that just... Um, just going back to um, not trying to beat dead horses on the height. If they meet the density, but they have, a, if we're talking about changing the height, then they can build it. Let's say they meet the density, but they want to just build it super tall to the, get the maximum height from a um, floor space in each unit. Does, is there concerns with that? I mean, if they meet the density in in that area, and you're concerned with how it looks, it fits into the neighborhood at the maximum height. Would we look at um, having a, a ceiling height or a top plate height at a certain height, if they met the, you know, once they meet the density. I mean, if it was just, let's just call it wasted space inside, they wanted 12 foot high ceilings instead of nine. Do you have any concerns with that? Or? Yeah, so the, the plate height, that's the term I got to remember. Um, I would think that, that that's a discussion we need to have. Do we, you know, if this is the density, how do they gonna meet it? Or are they gonna, do we have to give them this better setback requirements or? Remove some parking requirements um, in order to, you know, to fill that space. We want to keep it down to two stories, and the only way to do that is to have zero lot line or something. You know, those are kind of things we need to we need to talk about. But I and, and I, I think uh, I, I don't think I have a real strong opinion about um, where we want to give on that until until we should look at it in a case by case basis. So, what I'm hearing so far is there seems to be consensus that increasing density in all subzones by some amount is supported. And it might be as much as doubling it, or it may be even more. But that is that ultimately um, is contingent upon the height that would be required to achieve that density. So it might be necessary to um, dig into that a little bit deeper. So to look at, okay, to achieve 60 dwelling units per acre, here are the development standards that would need, be needed to achieve that. That might not be something that you're comfortable with in certain areas and would cause you to um, want to decrease that number a little bit. So I'm feeling like sort of we have good preliminary direction that you're open to an increase in density, perhaps a significant increase, maybe doubling it, and then we can come back to you with the implications of that in terms of the mass and size of those buildings, and then you can decide if that's something that you really want to do. 
Right. And everything doesn't have to stay, since we're rezoning stuff, doesn't have to stay zoned what it is right now. I mean, we may look at some areas that are zoned, you know, low density and think that really should be medium density or medium should be high or, you know, some of the highs should actually be medium because of where, you know, I, I think I think we're willing to look at the whole package to achieve what our ultimate goal is, and that's to provide more housing. Right. But again, we got multiple variables. We could change the building coverage maximum from 40% to 75%, and we right. wouldn't have to worry about height. It'd be all you know, one-story buildings. Yeah. Right. So we sort of... I think you're right. Okay. Yeah. And you know this sort of dove, dovetails into the the third agenda, so second agenda or is issue for discussion, which is the standards to achieve the densities. You know, I think that we'll be looking at the height. We'll be looking at building coverage, um, potentially increasing that. Um, I think that the Front and the side setbacks are probably okay, but we may need to look at the um, rear setback as well. So um, you can expect that that's one of the variables that we'll be looking at and coming back to you with more information on. And we'll definitely build in the plate height in the discussion for more architectural deviations. Um, just really thinking about the height and making sure there's room for beautiful architecture and not just in box. Uh, <laughs> I may ask, what's the purpose of defining a minimum on the lot area per unit? Why? I mean, that, why do we care? We want to build a 500 square foot condo. Why don't we let them? I think we have a. It, it ties back to your lot density. area. Per it's just unit. a calculation. I mean, I, the, yeah. it's not a minimum unit size. It's just a different way of expressing the density standard. Okay, so it's just so that could that's come all you're out. Saying. Yeah, we don't hold people to that. You've got to have it this big. There's, there's, there's no, there's no minimum unit size. You got it uh, in the zoning code. Thank you. So, um, I think we can go on to the last of these topics, and I know that we have in the audience patiently waiting. Um, so this is the topic that's about utilizing um, the uh, land that's owned by relig religious institutions for housing. Uh, there's a state law, SB4, um, that requires the city to allow uh, residential uses on these sites by right if they meet certain re requirements. They have to be all affordable. Um, they have to use prevailing wages, and they have to do, include other labor standards. Um, there's labor requirements as well. Uh, and so uh, the two sites are St. Joseph's and Shoreline Community Church, identified in the housing element as being potential for SB4 development. And so the zoning code um, needs to clarify what the rules are um, for these sites because, quite frankly, the state law is not uh, crystal clear on exactly what the rules would be for a residential project on these sites. They're zoned R1, um, and uh, we think that the zoning code needs to be clear about what um, the rules are that uh, apply to these sites. And um, the staff report lays out um, a couple of different options. Um, about um, specifying that only single family homes or duplexes are allowed and establish new standards for those. Um, make, uh, option two is to make it clear that any housing type is allowed on these sites, including multifamily, even though it's zoned R1, and that those units would be subject to the city's multi unit residential design standards. Um, and then there's also the opportunity to look at sort of a little finer grain at these individual sites and come up with site-specific standards. So if housing is developed under SB4 on those sites, um, there would be sort of rules about building placement and site layout um, defined within the uh, staff report. So um, 
we wanted to take this to the Planning Commission to see if you have any feedback for us about how uh, this issue should be addressed in the village. I think they ought to be specific for the site because those two sites are quite different. And doesn't, um, I forget what it's called, Shoreline, doesn't, isn't there already a low-income housing project on that property? Certainly don't think they need to be single family. I think it can be multifamily, but they need to be looked at a little differently because they're going to be quite different in size available to them. So there is an existing development on Shoreline. Um, I just I'm looking at uh, uh, Joseph's. Um, and I just had a sense that this is a this is an R1 very residential area. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would I, I, at least like option one for for this area, but if it's site specific, then that would be individually. Sure. Right. Yeah. What we would write in is that you know on the. St. Joseph's site, they could, you know, the height would be such and such, the density would be such and such. We have that kind of thing on the, in, in the, where the hotel is Just supposed like to be. Like we said on the mall, they can go up to 75 zone, zone. feet, you know. We just need to, to, be, need to be contextually incorporated into the, the shoreline seems to be nestled into the hills or the more of, more of a higher yeah, a higher um, height, and then St. Joseph's is more single-family neighborhood, especially across from the pool. So it just having it be fit in the context, I would feel it would be important to the neighbors. Also, you wouldn't on St. Joseph's. You wouldn't allow duplex. No, no, no. I think duplexes, yes, but I'm just saying, like, not the big, huge. A big, huge multifamily house. So why? So we could use option one, in, at least in St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. Like multifamily. Yeah, yeah, because it fits contextually. I feel in the neighborhood. There is that, there is that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we we could bring back standards that kind of re reflect that direction of uh, St. Joseph's being more like to fit within the R1 and shore life, shoreline to um, fit within multifamily. Okay. Uh, sorry, has there been any discussion uh, with New Brighton that they might potentially be looking at housing? I was just wondering, like, we're being sensitive to saying it's R1, but right across the street they're going to build housing that would be, you know, three stories high. I mean, we're definitely interested. There's been, so, you know, I, I definitely um, did some reaching out to to New Brighton during the housing element update, and there's interest there. There's no funding at this point, um, but they're doing some changes. I think they're they're moving their offices to Jade Street Park to that where the um, preschool is. So they're starting to move things around. They, you know, we just did the land swap. So I, I'm. Kind of hopeful that something might come up. I know a couple, um, they've talked with a few nonprofits, so we'll see what comes of it. I just think it's something to be, you know, pay attention to because it, if they do build mm -hmm. four stories and then we're trying to build, you know, only encourage single story across the street kind of a thing. <laughs> okay. Um, I just had one thing. Um, I mentioned in. Uh, a couple times it was mentioned here just about the missing middle um, part of this. And would that be, I mean, obviously not a topic for this evening, but um, something that we would, could, could focus on what that really looks like in the future. And I think there's lots of effort, which is very important for um, low-income housing and everything, but there's the whole missing middle. And it does seem like we have a, a lot of discussion about what that looks like and, um, you know, planning ahead and looking at long-term goals for that. You know, we we're just talking about housing you know, across the street you know, that New Brighton might be looking at in the future and stuff. And it would be a time and a process that we could kind of go through what the missing middle portion would look like on the overall uh, plans when we're looking at this. I think that would be 
that would be considered in the development standards um, that we bring back to you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other item involved in item C? No, that concludes the zoning code update. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Okay, okay moving on to item C. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Yeah. <laughs> So just, um, I did want to let you know, uh, Sean is going to be taking over the zoning code updates from here on out. So that, um, uh, thank you, Sean, as well for those the feedback tonight. And yep, so that'll be his project. So as we're moving forward, if you have comments or want to have discussions on zoning code update, feel free to message Sean, and he'll be the in between with Ben. And um, there's a new project. So great. Yep. Is that congratulations? That's a congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. Thank Guess you. what, Sean? <laughs> okay. Um, so moving on to item C, um, formerly item B, is 115 San Jose Avenue. It's proposed amendments to the master conditional use permit for the mixed use capital mercantile, mercantile to allow off-site sale of alcoholic beverages and extend hours of operations to 11 p.m. on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, currently 10 p.m. Do you have a staff presentation? Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, Chair Christensen and commissioners. Um, I've got a short presentation here for you, but um, certainly we're looking at the Capitola Mercantile, 115 San Jose Avenue. Uh, this is really an anchor property in the Capitola Village on the inland side of Esplanade. Uh, has multiple commercial tenants, residential uses, um, three, di three different buildings, parking on site, uh, and it's currently operating under a master conditional use permit. Um, the request before you tonight has a, a few different layers, so just highlight them here uh, on the top of the, of the item. Uh, so we're looking at amendments to that master conditional use permit uh, with regard to the hours as noted and uh, also to get rid of a condition of approval that currently prohibits off-site sales. Uh, and this would be in, with a retail uh, reach-in refrigerator selling uh, prepackaged beer, wine, seltzer, and kombuchas. Uh, there is a new tenant that is proposing to locate into suite 101 and 103. And then we're looking at signage permitting on the Esplanade frontage. And then there's a design permit, which is really somewhat of a cleanup item for a roofing uh, repair project that was completed, uh, and it was completed without the benefit of permits, but we're using this opportunity to uh, retroactively have the Planning Commission review it because it would have required a design permit. Um, so I mentioned the background of the, of the uh, MCUP being established in 2020. Uh, so. What that did was allow takeout restaurants and tasting rooms to operate within the building uh, up to a 50% number of, of tenants with type 41 ABC licenses. Um, and then with regard to this tenant space, 101 specifically, uh, under the new tenant use permit being requested, there was a, a similar use previously occupied by the space, um, and that was Little Codes. So just for the benefit of the room, what is a master conditional use permit? Uh, it's just a tool that allows a property owner and the city to predetermine allowable uses for a specific multi-tenant property, usually a larger property. Um, and so once established, it allows for easier transition of tenants coming in and out, um, basically a pre-approval. And so then when tenants turn over, they can, they can come in and out with an administrative permit rather than come back to the Planning Commission each time there's a potential for a, a use permit. It also allows for some customization of uses on site. And so with this property, there's a shared premises, um, which all tenants can use. Um, back a little bit, just to lay of the land. Um, on the upper photo I've got the, on the left side, this is called the annex building. This is part of the, of the mercantile property. Uh, the top is residential, the lower is parking and a small commercial tenant space, and then on the right is the, the primary building. 
uh, the mercantile. And then on the bottom is this, the frontage we'll be talking about the most, and this is the one on Esplanade. And there's the patio there in front as well, which we'll talk about. So getting into the internals of the building, uh, this is a floor plan, um, slightly different orientation. Uh, and what I've highlighted here is uh, Suite 101, which is the proposed hop shop. And it's a 324 square feet, and it's split by uh, a primary access corridor. And then uh, Suite 103 would be sort of back of house support storage uh, for the operation. And then this is the adjacent shared use space, uh, which is a patio, which would um, be utilized by the, the proposal. Uh, giving you a little bit more background on the shared premises. So this goes back to 2020 and the highlighting here uh, is the shared premises. So this is the center corridor um, within the, the mercantile space. And then here is the larger patio adjacent to suite 101. And then there's a smaller patio um, out another exit next to the annex building. So all of these collectively are listed in the master conditional use permit, have their own subset of conditions of approval that the applicant is proposing to modify. Uh, so just diving into those, um, there's also a need for, uh, between staff and coordinating with ABC, uh, these, these conditions highlighted in yellow are actually um, generated from staff at ABC to coordinate with the current proposal uh, if approved. And so the first one, actually the first two is really uh, about uh, controlled space and accountability for uh, patrons that are consuming alcohol on the premises and knowing where they, uh, which customers they are. So with, with multiple tenants, we want to identify distinguishable containers. Um, previously, the condition required them to be different colors. And uh, after discussing with the ABC rep, um, we, we actually think the reality is that they'd probably just have logos on the glasses. And so we're removing the color requirement and saying or color. Um, and then number two, and this is just to coincide with the applicant's request of having a can, prepackaged can and bottle sales, is that the a customer that was, was buying one of those for on-site consumption would also be provided with a distinguishable container. And number three, no proposed change. So this is just about alcohol signage, just because of the mix of uses and uh, notifying customers of when they're leaving the premises and to not allow alcohol into certain areas. Uh, number four is uh, with regard to not consuming off property. Five is uh, just a notification to all operators that uh, there can be consequences if they don't follow conditions. Uh, number six requires that they actively monitor if they're using these shared premises. They're not all visible from every location, so there's a need for active monitoring. And then now in the purple, we're getting into the specific request of the applicant. So uh, seven has to do with the hours. So it's currently eight to 10. And the request before you is for Thursday through Saturday to extend to 11 p.m. Uh, there's no change to condition eight about audible entertainment. And then condition nine is requested to be struck. Uh, and staff worked with ABC and police department on this and um, we understand that this condition was added to um, preemptively prohibit off-site consumption and both agencies are, are not overly concerned about that. They don't believe that uh, this condition is necessarily preventing um, off, uh, open container violations and, and they, the police department specifically thinks that they would, would uh, control that a different way. Um, so neither had an issue with removing that condition. Um, so just to kind of recap, so staff and ABC uh, are recommending a, a modification to the allowable containers uh, and the applicant is requesting extension to hours and uh, to allow prepackaged sales for offsite. And this is where I wanted to be clear that once we did the analysis, we, we looked into the hours of operation specifically and uh, businesses within the area and the zoning and the noise ordinance. And so we're ultimately not supportive of extending the hours. Um, 
bars that are in the immediate area that do stay open later than 10 have different licenses and they also have adequate indoor area. The subject's proposal is really relying quite a bit on an outdoor space, so um, that's not really a direct comparable. And then the noise ordinance also talks about prohibiting noise within sleeping areas after 10 p.m. Uh, within 200 feet of sleeping areas, that is, and there's a hotel next door and some residential uses within that proximity. And then uh, in the staff report, I discuss uh, that the outdoor, this is not an outdoor dining deck, but that is a relatively recent standard that was uh, determined that hours would be limited to 10 p.m. And this is going to function much in the same way in the same location. So we, we found it as an appropriate guide to, uh, to the recommendation, although, again, not directly applicable. So staff is not supportive of extending the extra hour. Uh, getting into the tenant use permit. So the, the mercantile allows 50% of the area that is available to commercial tenants to uh, serve alcohol. So this would bring to 32%, so no issue there. Uh, takeout restaurants and tasting rooms are permitted by the current MCUP. Uh, they, are, they do have some limits on seats, and they need to have a Type 41 license. They can use the shared premises. And I can confirm that the applicant is actively working with ABC for a Type 41, has done site posting and mailing, and also is working with County Health to uh, secure change of ownership for the restaurant uh, permit. So this is the, the floor plan diagram that we were provided uh, corresponding to Suite 101 and 103. So again, 103 is uh, storage, support, back of house space. And then 101 is the, uh, really the one that the plan lower here is kitchen area, prep area, sink line, and then at the top it's point of sale, two indoor seats, the merchandise, refrigerators, and, and kegerators. So pretty simple operation. Um, outdoor patio seating to the left and then access to the mercantile floor on the right. So looking at the sign permit, uh, the, the linear frontage here, so straight out of the code, you get a half a square foot per linear foot in the mixed-use village. So uh, total allowable signage would be 25 and a half square feet, and um, window signage is being proposed, and no more than 25% of an individual window can be covered. Uh, this request is somewhat simplified uh, to show only seven and a half square feet of signage, and we understand that the owner uh, is working to uh, provide kind of a more comprehensive master sign program for the mercantile in the, in the coming months. Um, but what's being proposed is uh, compliant with current code, and that's what we're reviewing tonight. And lastly, we have the, the design permit request. So uh, on the left is the prior awning, and then on the right is showing current condition. Um, so the, the requirement would be get a building permit for this roofing change, and then the design permit aspect of it is before you this evening. And the last thing that I will do is just talk about uh, some staff recommendations for the master use permit conditions. These are really just operating conditions, um, to good housekeeping items for the most part. So garbage area should be maintained. Um, this is a condition we add for most similar uses. It just wasn't included for the MCUP. And then outdoor lighting to be turned off um, within uh, half an hour of closing time, so not be left on all night. Food and beverage equipment not stored outside, which is a uh, code violation anyway. Uh, and then all applicants would obtain health permits as required. On-site restrooms be available to all customers at all times. And then the last one, uh, this is just based on a recent site walk. They, the interior, interior space of the mercantile has pretty good signage that uh, notifies customers not to bring alcohol into the arcade spaces, but uh, there are a few entries to arcades that, that could use some additional signage, so we're recommending that that get worked out with a condition. So we are recommending approval uh, as presented uh, with the with the findings that you find in the staff report, uh, conditions six through eleven that, that we've added, and the modified um, shared use space conditions, uh, with the exception of the extended hours. 
and I do believe the applicant and their, their team are here and would like to make a presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Oh, come on. <laughs> Good evening, uh, honorable commissioners. Um, this is really not a changing use of what, what's been there for the last three years. They had the same license. They had, it had a food service license, an alcohol license. It hasn't been a problem. Uh, we're not creating something new here. The, it, it's expanded only in that it's allowed to, to sell beer or take off-site. If you bought a six-pack or a, a can of beer to take off-site, you're allowed to do that. Okay. Um, we, we agree with all the conditions of approval with the exception of um, uh, we think that should be allowed to stay open till 11. And if you look at the businesses directly across the street, Sandbar and three or four of them, that's what time they close down. It's a time people close down there. And every one of those, any one of those businesses along the Esplanade have an outside seating area as well as inside. We're not, this is a type of use that really make, works in that, in that community down there, particularly on the Esplanade side. Um, the mercantile has been a problem. I mean, nobody remembers, but it used to be a bowling alley. And it's been changed three or four times in, in its uses. And it hasn't survived through anything besides putting it into a, uh, a gaming business in there. And then the few that are faced over on the San Jose Avenue have been able to say. But, so it's, it's difficult to find tenants that, that work in this thing. And it is important, even though that outside area that's outside of this restaurant is, is really considered a common area. It is, it's not exclusive use to this restaurant. It's, it can be used by, by any one of the businesses that are in that area. But yes, will they be using that? People go to Capitola and we all know this. We want to sit outside. You know, it's a natural place for us to be on, on, on a beach, beach type of climate. But to, I'm going to repeat, I'm, we, we agree with all the condition approval, but we think we should have um, consideration for 11 o'clock closing just as as a number of the businesses along the Esplanade do. It's the same time they do. And um, I'm looking forward to this business. Actually, it's going to be a good business in that in the mercantile. And it helps um, someday maybe draw some use to it. It's a difficult building also to draw people into. And a couple of the signs that are shown on that, on that end of the building that were open signs is showing that to them because it's not just them that's open. The building is open to the inside too, uh, even though they have earlier closing hours. Uh, I think um, I think the uh, um, Italian restaurant and uh, closes later, if I'm not mistaken. But other than that, everyone else in that building is closed down by that time. But uh, it's it's a good use for the village. It's what people go there to do, and uh, uh, and it brings people and money to our city. It's a good business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, Doug. Um, excuse me. Um, what was the, um, just maybe you, you are always able to provide a historical uh, <laughs> perspective. Um, when it received its original um, alcohol license, what was the vision of at that time that the mercantile was going to be? I, I was just trying to understand the history of like, um, you know, with now with the arcade there, you know, and now, obviously, that's newer, but, you know, how things have changed. What was the overall vision in just history, if you could summarize well, it? Well, if, if, if you went back maybe 10 or 15 years, there was almost, a lot of like small business clothing stores in there. But it was, for some reason, it's, it's kind of off the path of walking through the village. That was real hard to get people to come in through the doors. And so they didn't stay there to survive. Now, there is, uh, there is a coffee shop inside there, okay? And then we have the businesses on the, the, the taffy shop and the, uh, um, the Italian restaurant. And um, uh, they, actually, the Italian restaurant has permission to use the interior of that mall and that common area for seating, too. They, they, when, they get, when they get full, they, they use that inside. So it stays open as long as the restaurant does. Um, and I, I have with me is, um, is uh, Evan, Evan Jox. Is, he is the owner of this business, and, and he's here to answer any questions. And also... Um, the owner, the uh, uh, the uh, manager of the mercantile here is also so they can they can answer the business end of this better than I can. If you'd like to speak to them, they're here to, here to help you. Thank you. Did you have any? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just had a question. Okay. Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have any questions? 
questions for staff? Nope. All right. Thanks, Mr. Spencer. Thank you. Hi, hey everybody. Uh, I'm Evan Jakes. I'm the owner of uh, Barrel and Hops. It's going to be called the Hop Shop in Capitola. Looking forward to doing business here. Uh, thank you, Brian. I think you did a great job kind of summing up uh, what we're doing. Um, I had just kind of a couple things I wanted to sum up. Uh, for us, the biggest thing was removing that condition number nine of um, prohibiting off-premise sales. Um, I just want to be clear: we're not a um, we're not like a liquor store. We're not doing some sort of cheap type of product. We're basically a, a craft beer tap room and tasting room. That's our primary core business. Um, so we partner with over 100 different breweries, mostly in California. Um, they're some of the best of the best. We're, we try very, very hard to bring in the best product we can find. Um, a lot of it's local, Santa Cruz, Salinas, Monterey. Um, but as far as uh, Sacramento, San Diego, all over the place. Um, a big chunk of our business is off-premise sales, at least 15%. Um, so before I signed a lease, I reached out to the city to ask them about that provision in the use permit <clears throat> and was basically not assured, but um, given enough confidence that it shouldn't be a problem for us to do business here and remove that condition. Otherwise, I would not have signed a lease and I would not be doing business in Capitola. Um, so that's a pretty big deal for me. Um, and then I had just two kind of comments slash questions that I wanted to bring up about um, the signage, um, just for my own clarification, because we've gone back and forth just a little bit, Brian, um, <clears throat> on there were some comments about in the window, you can use 25% of the window for signage. Does it need to be on the interior or the is it okay on the exterior of, of the window? So the code for window signage so it does say it needs to be affixed to the inside. Okay. All right. Um, and then my second comment or question was we were recently told to remove um, exterior lights on the patio. Um, before I moved in, the patio had um, market LED lights, string lights over the patio, um, which I guess were not in compliance with the city code. Um, obviously for the convenience of our guests, for the safety of our staff, and for the ability of our staff to do their job, especially in respect with restrictions set by ABC that we need to monitor the patio, the, that shared use area, we need lighting on that patio. Um, so I just wanna put that uh, in front of the council as long as we're discussing this area, that we do need to have some sort of lighting. And I would propose that we put back the lights that have been there for several years. I'm not sure how many years I, I just came in here recently. That's my only uh, comments. Uh, does the council have any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Doug. Full wine bar. My wife would be here tonight too, but. She's running the show. Keep this real quick. So, um, again, my name is Doug with Capitola Wine Bar. We're the other tenant on the other side right next to Caruso's, right? So in 2017, we agreed to purchase the remaining assets of what was known as Capitola or Cava, Cava in the mercantile. We had access to a mop sink that is required by the health department. When the MCUP of 2020 ensued, Capitola Wine Bar was shuttered and was not made aware of the proposed changes to the facility. We lost the access to our required mop sink and restroom upon reopening after COVID. We were not informed by the holder of the master use permit of any changes in 2020 or now. And you'll see on your sheet, I made some notes that that's required. This change in the bathroom and sink access has been damaging and costly to our business. The modification is detrimental to public health and safety and detrimental to our business. In peak times, the restaurants and bars do not have access to a mop sink to clean spills. This is not safe. In addition, it creates a loss in sales when a business must close their doors, like the taffy shop has to do right now, to go wait in a bathroom line. When a cook has to go, like at Caruso's, and he has 15 orders in front of him, they do not have time to wait in a long bathroom line. Meanwhile, the real public restroom at the beach is vacant. This is not reasonable or healthy for our employees. Melissa from, Car from Caruso's wanted me to add, 
he has suffered two UTI infections because of not being able to use the restroom. Because of this change, we now incur the cost of maintaining a public restroom, which is only increasing costs in our lease. The property management company for the Mercantile, which is in Portland, was not made clearly aware of this change in our bathroom use when it occurred in 2020. It has become apparent that it was a damaging kitchen condition to require. But now we have an opportunity here to fix that. Please return one of the two bathrooms, with one with the mop sink, back to private use like it was before pandemic. It is a health and safety issue. As for the hours, currently Capitola Wine Bar, our latest hours are 10 p.m. inside, 9 p.m. outside. Before the pandemic, our hours were as late as 11. Then we may wish to return our hours to 11. It was, that was before COVID. It seems quite equitable and necessary that the hours again align with the arcade, the bathroom access, and the other businesses like my new neighbor, the hop shop. Currently, inebriated persons are permitted to loiter in the arcade. This is a growing problem that is not good for the village or our business and should no longer be permitted by the property owner and highlighted as a condition of use by the arcade. You'll see on your notes, number six actually is that condition that needs to be enforced. We have a regular homeless person in there with permission. Alcohol in the mercantile. Capital and Wine Bar, we hold a Type 42 license. This specific license that permits on and off-site sales without food. It premieres, the, it appears in this MUCP, uh, they want us tenants to change to, to a type 41. We do not wish to have our license changed as that type holds a different value in the marketplace. We are in compliance with the ABC rules and will continue to sell our permitted items to go. Again, we are uninformed of the intentions of the property owner as we are not informed by the holder of the master use permit of any changes then in 2020 or now. Thank you for your time. We hope you return the mop sink access for our safety and our health and uh, encourage the discuss your hours and uh, please encourage the property owner not to uh, permit loitering. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to talk, to speak on that? Yep. Questions for staff? Um, one thing uh, I had written down about enforcement, how does enforcement get handled? Um, I know some of the uh, merchants do a very good job at, uh, if you do go to the wine bar and you do want to go to Crusoe's, they uh, very nicely will walk your uh, glass of wine from one door to the other and to make sure that you just don't walk out the door, you know, whatever, 15 feet. I was wondering, how does the enforcement work on that? Um, is it just uh, strictly by PD? Um, is how the enforcement works for the alcohol part of the thing? To uh, for just, just alcohol, like if, if alcohol is out on in the front of this new um, establishment, uh, with how's the enforcement work by by PD? So the the servants area and the point of sale and the consumption area are all contiguous. So there's no transition off off site. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, also, uh, enforcement is done not only by Capitola PD. For, first and foremost, it's the, um, the business owner has to maintain it. But also, ABC does enforcement as well. And we, the city has recently, we've been receiving grant money to actually like do um, trial runs of having folks who are not old enough to buy liquor. They, they will go around our liquor our our bar establishments throughout Capitola. And so that, that's also another practice and that's through grant money that our police department received. All right, and then um, do we know what the hours of the other establishments are in the mercantile specifically? Any of them that are using the shared premises, the shared premises has an hour till 10 p.m. So that may be, maybe the difference from what you heard in the comment is that there's not, they're not using the shared premises. And then just to confirm, and I know you highlighted the outdoor dining is set at 10 o'clock. Is that correct? Yeah, that, because that's part of the shared shared premises. Um, outdoor dining in the dining building. deck specifically. Dining deck, sorry. Have have a lim an hour at 10 p.m. And we were making the comparison with similar impact. Um, and that's any location of the outdoor dining? In the village. In the village. Yeah. It goes for all of them, yeah. Um, just, uh, I guess, uh, regarding the 
when the comments were made about the bathroom facilities, how did, um, I mean, I, I don't know how you, I mean, how, how does the city get into enforcement in that? And, you know. Where's the problem here? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but, well, we're, I think you didn't. We started, yeah. it, but we had never closed it. So, yeah, closing the public hearing, <laughs> moving to staff. <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was a presentation, and then we came back for questions. I apologize. I apologize. I, please continue, Jerry. <laughs> Those are. Um, I was just wondering how how that's handled. So, I was a little surprised that there wasn't a condition in the original MCUP from 2020 about bathroom use because it's pretty typical that we want customers to have access to that during operating hours. So that's why it's it's one of the recommended conditions. So to be available to customers during uh, any customer service hours. And that, I, I do recall back in 2020 when the master conditional use permit was reviewed, that was a discussion point and um, I thought it was a condition back then of uh, so there it might have been maybe the red line didn't make it into the, the final permit but there there was a requirement of maintaining opening those two bathrooms to the public and the purpose for that was at the time of reviewing the master CUP there was an issue with the public not being able like having to go all the way over to the beach bathrooms because there were not enough bathrooms on site for the uses. Uh, the requirement for the businesses to have bathroom facilities for their employees is, is there not one? For a mop sink, I don't, I don't know. I'm not I was wondering. I mean, it seems like with that comment, it was very focused on public uh, having restroom facilities, and then isn't there would there be a requirement for uh, established for businesses to having uh, bathroom facilities? So the overall building has to comply with the health and safety regulations and. Um, as for the individual tenants and whether or not they're required to have bathrooms, I don't think they do have bathrooms. So that, that wasn't required at the time of those um, different facilities coming in. So it's a shared bathroom. So, just so I, I think there's two bathrooms. There are. And I think one bathroom was used by the employees and had the mop sink in it. And then there was just one bathroom that was open for the customers. And what I'm hearing you say is when they did the master use permit, they changed that, that both of those bathrooms were going to be public bathrooms, which leaves the employees uh, having to stand in line to use those particular bathrooms and also, there's no mop sink or anything for them to use to um, clean up. So we, we could discuss, I think, legally having available one public restroom and, and the one that they were asking for to be a private. going to do just we're on discussion right yeah, yeah we're on discussion um so i you know uh, i could approve this project but i would have to have a few additional conditions on it um i i talked to the people who are the hotel which is the property next door to this and um they um uh, first said that the owner had been out of town for a couple of weeks and the manager was, you know, unaware of this, but noise is real important for that business to be able to continue to operate. And I know it's difficult to operate businesses down in the village. There are a lot of constraints. And I think it's important that we don't bring in a new business that's going to have a significant ne negative impact on an existing building down there. So I think it's traditional, you know, in the hotels that things are quiet after 10 o'clock. Uh, we decided with the outdoor dining decks that it was important to have a 10 o'clock time uh, for those to close. And so, you know, for me to support this project, they would also need to close at 10 o'clock 
um, uh, and particularly because of the impact they have on the hotel, which actually has, you know, room windows and stuff that uh, sort of look down over this patio area. Um, I also think that, um, uh, you know, uh, the plans that we got for this outdoor area were pretty sketchy, but I think um, condition number one of approval uh, needs to have added to it, uh, you know, that the plans include the four outdoor tables and 16 chairs um, uh, um, or, or what's going to be there. <coughs> and if they're going to change that, they need to come in and work with staff and come up with a different plan for uh, doing something different out there. But that's sort of all we have to go on right now. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, we're talking about a master use permit for this entire building, and there are a number of areas where, you know, uh, businesses have put up illegal signs that, um, and I think that um, saying prior to occupancy, which would give them some time to deal with them, that the building signage needs to come into conformance, which is what is required. We typically make, you know, anyone coming in for a permit to conform to what they were supposed to do to get a new permit. But this would give them time and they could work on the signage. Uh, I think it's important that there's no outdoor amplified music, which may have been in the conditions I, I've got to remember. Uh, I think the condition says something about, you know, music which can be heard on the sidewalk or beyond their property line. And um, I, I think that um, that's important too, but, you know, I want to make certain that they understand the amplified music and the issues there. Um, if they want to add lights, then, um, you know, again, they can, they can come in with some sort of plan to add lights, but... I don't think it's appropriate for us to add lights tonight since we don't really know ex exactly what we were talking about. Evidently, there was a problem with the prior lights, so let's not recreate the problem we had. Let's figure out a way to solve that with, without it being a problem. Um, so for me, um, you know, we would, we would have to add those conditions to it um, to, um, you know, for, the, for me to vote for the project. You're, you go through the amplified music thing because, you know, uh, you walk by the Cork and Fork wine bar, which is across the street, and those guys are, you know, yeah. blaring out music all the time. Where's your mic? And we, you know, I, I don't want to treat people necessarily differently. Right. I don't want to treat people differently. I do think there's special noise requirements because the hotel's there. Mm -hmm. You know, our ordinance talks about, you know, noise next to residential and sleeping areas. And I don't think that the music that's going on at the Cork and Fork is anything that's gotten a permit for. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's more of an enforcement issue than... Do they have a permit for the Cork and They don't have a permit for amplified music. Or right? just for... They... I would have to look it up, but I do recall something about the within the original conditional use permit and design permit, they applied to have that door that rolls up, and they weren't supposed to have any amplified music. And when they have music, that door is supposed to be closed so that you can't. Kind of like the um, the Bay Bar has the same. <laughs> they if they play after a certain time, they're supposed to close their window. I think that was a condition. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand that it was part of the health de department's requirements. These front doors going into the mercantile will have to remain closed all the time because since they have food in there, they can't have open open doors there. So um, but I think that that's a health department requirement. Just a follow-up question. Um, we heard that Every business in there closes hours or operation at 10. I thought I heard earlier that it was 11 at one time. Was it changed? So the, the condition is about the shared premises. And so the any use of the shared premises is limited until 10 p.m. And it's always been there. Since 2020. Yeah. Okay. 
Russo's is only open until 8.30. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah, they're their sign says 8.30. Would there be um, any um, cleanup or any way that we could address the bathroom issue at the same time, or is that just another enforcement thing? Yeah, I uh, for me, I I don't I don't know if we can, we can address the bath. I don't know if we have enough information to address the bathroom issue. But um, you know, I certainly think it's um, it it seems like we need know what's required by the health departments, what's uh, going on. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, we need to look into it. And if, you know, uh, prior to occupancy, you know, staff should have information on whether or not it meets the appropriate requirement. Well, we, yeah, we got this. We shouldn't be penalizing the hop yeah. guys for, for a bathroom that's not. Right, right, yeah. So, so we have to split this thing yeah. up. I was just looking at some follow up from the city to yeah. address that issue. Yeah, so just, um, to be clear, I think there, there was a condition added. I just want to like get, and I don't think it transferred into the final master use permit that uh, was attached to the staff report. So their condition. Number 14 was added during the uh, master use permit that both bathrooms within the Capitola Mercantile shall be kept open to the public during business hours. So that's an existing condition. Um, I, I do think the, the health department, in terms of having a sink in order or an area to do a mop cleaning, that's something we can look into um, and get more. Um, just more facts on that and see if there's uh, a reasonable condition. The The one thing is that with opening the hop shop um, <laughs> and people are consuming more beverages, the lines will only get longer. So I don't, so for now, what, what type of condition, just, just checking in on the. I just want to make sure it's in, okay. in, in com com you know, compliance or in from a follow-up standpoint, I don't like. Uh, I think it was mentioned, uh, Paul. I don't think you know we would want to connect that back to the new applicant yeah. coming in, and then just a follow-up to the lighting. You know, I think for being able to provide and give some assurance of that outdoor lighting can be a possibility. You know, if it was within the standard of what we just allowed in the outdoor dining deck or something like that, yeah. you know, would give them some assurance that it wouldn't be something that would be, you know, a lot of labor-intensive work to look at. Yeah, go ahead. This business is under governorship of alcohol and firearms, number one. Number two is the health department of the county of Santa Cruz will require everything you've asked for. They will require that. They cannot serve do food service until they get a permit to do that. It includes the mop sink, includes the, the dish sinks. All those things are part of the listing that he has to solve in that, in that business. And by the way, they were all solved at, by the prior business, but they will be so solved again by this owner because every time there's a change in ownership, they require these conditions to be fulfilled. So cleanliness, um, the, the facilities, uh, and those type of issues are all taken care of by your environmental health department. He cannot open a business. into it. So let's don't put conditions on, on him to keep him from opening business by things that, that, that are under control by a different, by a different department. This is, you know, the bathroom issue. I know nothing about what that's about, but but uh, um, if there was a previous condition that there was two bathrooms, there is two bathrooms now. But I don't know why there's an issue about it, but if there is, and, and believe me, this is not even one tenth of the intensity that building used to be under. There's very few people in that building compared to what it was in the past. I don't know why two more than two bathrooms is necessary, but but uh, um, I, I think. I hope you concentrate on this business, not on the whole bird building. It's not fair to take him and make him subject to every, all the concerns about that. The difference that. is he's operating under a master use permit, which is the whole building. 
I mean, we're, it's not an individual business coming in. You're asking to modify the master use permit. So that's why the whole building comes in play. Though I do agree with you, this bathroom issue is a new one, and it's not one for us to solve tonight. Okay. Okay, but uh, I, hopefully you won't, won't make an issue. This guy's been trying, going through a big process here to get, get this business back in there that was already there. And um, his intentions are good. He's a good business for Capitol. We can't discourage businesses to come to Capitol. We got too many vacancies in it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm. <laughs> Let you be clear. You're you're going to put in a mop sink. <laughs> That's yes. Okay. Well, I'll, no, you can't. Yeah. Just if you want to come up. <laughs> That's okay. Good. Um. So I'm willing to make a motion if we're ready. So just be before we go any further, there's just a couple of things I wanted to retouch on that I'm not totally clear on. So I wanted to offer a little more information about the lights. So the, the current code doesn't allow string lights other than holiday lights or for religious celebration seasonally. So it's inherently limited in time, which is why there was a requirement to remove the ones that were there. Now we currently have dining decks that allow string lights. So there's in inconsistency with the lighting code and and that so um, could we kind of broad brush it and say that since it is an exterior we're gonna I'm gonna I think I have a solution to all of this would you like to make a motion Susan <laughs> so Anything the, I, I just so that's that that I just wanted to give you the clarity of where that comes from and how it ties in also to the dining deck but also the music so currently the condition is to um, not allow music to be audible from off-site. So that would be the sidewalk. There are speakers that face the patio. So if the commission could give us some tangible direction on maybe volume or hours, that would help us in regulating it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, you know, I think the con condition about the music not being audible off-site is pretty standard in a lot of areas. And um, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think that's probably a good one. And clearly the music can't offer, they can't use those speakers, you know, beyond 10 o'clock, if that's the time that, that we uh, come to for limiting it. Um, you know, um, personally, I, you know, I, I would probably be more comfortable if they weren't playing music outside the building into that open space. But uh, as long as it's not, you know, audible beyond their property line, then it's probably not a big deal. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that. Okay, so here is my motion that we, we approve it. Uh, amending uh, condition of approval number one to say that the plans include four outdoor tables with 16 chairs in the public access area and that's what they're going to have if they decide later to change that they'll need to come in and, and modify that because we don't have a plan for anything different uh, prior to issuing uh, an additional condition would be prior to issuing an occupancy permit, all businesses under the master uh, conditional use permit will bring their signage in conformance to the city's <laughs> regulations. Um, and another condition is that there will be no outdoor amplified music um, and if staff wants, they could add that to the condition about, you know, the music that's there um, not being discernible beyond the property lines. Um, uh, I would say that the business will close at 10 p.m. and consistent with the other outdoor dining decks um, and areas and in consideration to the hotel that's next door. I would say that the, another condition is that they could work on a lighting plan with staff that's consistent with the lighting that's allowed for the outdoor dining decks, um, uh, you know, which would give them the opportunity to solve that problem and come up with something that conforms to our ordinance. 
So with those conditions and the conditions that staff listed um, in their staff report and the um, um, uh, I would move uh, approval of this application. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Oh, I just had a question. Of, uh, sorry, one last one. Really? Just uh, regarding the signage, would it be a condition that all the signage in the whole entire building be brought up to the right standard? I think there's just been a lot of illegal signs put up, and it's mainly taking down those illegal signs. Yeah. Um, I do just ask maybe if we got amended. So I, um, I don't know what the time frame of this uh, applicant opening up his business, and I would hate to see if the owner of other establishments, I mean, other businesses there weren't taking down their signs, that that would slow up him opening up his business. And so, you know, could there be uh, a lead time of, you know, over you know six months, and then that address issue has to be brought up with the mercantile owner more so than just, um, the applicant trying to be the person who enforces Well, I, I think we could do something that says that, you know, it would come into conformance, say, in 90 days or this permit will be revoked. And you revoking on the hop shop? On the, on the hop shop. Dennis is here, I'm not lying. Um, Dennis, if you want to speak, come up to the podium. <laughs> or, no, we're act actually, we're with the most, Dennis, we're actually, we're, we're closed public hearing. Let's just, let's move on. If, if you have gone by there in the last day or so, half the signs have come off the building, okay? And, and when that sign ordinance was written, in fact, um, I'm sorry, but I wrote it. But uh, for that, the master use permit there, and um, it, it, there's there's certain things in there that that should not even be in there. For instance, the Dewar's Landing, big signs on top. Those aren't signs. That's a definition of the building, and they were included in there when they when they made the counts of the areas, and so it's never calculated correctly. I, I agree. There's signs up that are sloppy and need to be fixed, but. Please don't don't put a condition on him staying in business by that being corrected. Give us a, enough time period that we can deal with the owner and get and get those things off there and, and get them corrected. And we will we are going to come in for a new master sign permit. We will come in for a new on that. But give us give us enough time to. Uh, don't, don't, the guy doesn't want to live in fear of being shut down because the, the rest of the building is in conformance. Yeah. Please, Understood. thank you. Okay, so let's finish with our motion and what? Can we go back to the by music clause is there a condition you're adding right i just want to say that there's no amplified music on the outdoor deck area that's fair so i'm not talking about your speakers i'm talking about amplified music you know live amplified music bands playing out there oh, guitars okay. i thought you meant okay. an amplifier yeah. like no speakers Near the yeah. No, the speakers are covered because they they can't broadcast music that goes beyond their property right. lines. Okay. So you're saying no live. I want them to know that they can't have any live amplified music out there. That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had a quick. Okay. I can, can I ask a quick question? I apologize. Sure. I just wanted to clarify a couple things. Is um the would the business be allowed to be open to 11 and the, the dining deck be closed at 10, like to conform with everybody else, it, the, the outdoor dining deck? That's what I'm hearing, right? That's so first, um, I, I think we have to bring more order into this review. I think this is the time when the Planning Commission is going through like having a, an internal discussion. So I just want to start there. Um, and so the 11 o'clock requirement was in this application. I'll let Brian. So again, it's the, it's the shared premises. So right. the interior spaces are not, don't have a time and, and hours of operation limit currently. Okay. But the business itself can still be open till 11 if they are serving within their own. But they don't have any room to serve in there. Well, and well, this is about him, though, right now. So I'm, 
I, I, I can't converse. Okay, no more talking. <laughs> um, you can, but he only has two seats inside. Gotcha. It's different than when he like Zelda things and stuff. Like he's got indoor seats. So I, I think you should stick with the seats. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I think there's common area uh, inside the center that they're allowed to use. So, you know, they have seating throughout the whole center. So they could, sure. it going to, well, the idea of having it shut down on the outside, they could still run their operation. Right now, they show two seats inside. I think they're allowed to have six, and they could use the common space on the inside. Yeah. Or can they, they? The common space on the inside is subject to the same requirements Thank as the common comment. space on the outside. So it would be limited to the two seats within their area. Okay. And really hard to. Thank you for clarifying. I was wrong. I just I just go back to my is there another way of enforcement on the signs um, that staff could come up with so it's not penalizing just the the applicant today that like that's the code enforcement person not trying to, for himself to stay in business yes definitely um, so another avenue for bringing this into conformance Brian I don't know do you <laughs> signs to bring uh, to the signs that are out of conformance into conformance? So uh, the way I would see a condition for the signs playing out is we would work with the applicant prior to occupancy. I mean, I think that's what the recommendation is currently, but we would work with them to look at the current code or look at what was previously permitted and signs that don't have a record or don't comply. Yeah, they, and, yeah, and then the, the other avenue would be to not have a condition or, or pretty much put a condition on staff to start code enforcement within two weeks if there's still violations for other tenant spaces. At, so then it, it's no longer the applicant's um, issue. It's more of staff making sure this building comes up into compliance. But it's not going to hold up his business from actually progressing and opening up if the building signage is not exactly yep. it would be just staff pursuing code enforcement on the other tenant spaces if you'd rather us go about it that way so could you amend so could you amend that? my motion to say for the that staff will um when i mean it actually doesn't even have to be a condition it, it can just be direction that's not tied to this permit and will follow through. Okay, so we're giving direction to you to do code enforcement on the signs on the building. Okay, so I'll take that condition out since we've given them that direction. Do we have a motion? We Anybody? Go through it again for Corey. <laughs> Gotta find my piece of paper, I put it away. Okay, so um, uh, one was, uh, you know, the outside area will have four outdoor tables and 16 chairs, as they show on their plan. Um, that um, uh, there be no uh, outdoor amplified live music taking place. Uh, that the business will close at 10 p.m. Uh, and that they will work with staff on a lighting plan that's consistent with what's allowed for the outdoor dining decks. I'm sorry, one, uh, two, Commissioner uh, uh, Kirsten's comment. There, they can, they can, the building, the business can stay open until 11, is that correct? Or is it 10 o'clock? I thought it's 10 o'clock outdoor for business. No, it's 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock across for all businesses. Shared premises. Yeah. Okay. Just like Caruso closes at 10 o'clock now. Time bar. So to so I have to say I have to ask that nobody speaks from the peanut so, gallery. Yeah. I understand, but we're we're just the, it's like over and above. 
We can show it. It's, it's the, the shared premises related to operation of type 41 licenses is limited to 10 p.m. Thank you. So his operation could stay open till 11. That's what, yeah. That's why I, I, that's why I was getting to. So he could, his business, he, outdoor dining is at 10, but if he had the last two people, they moved inside, they can be in his establishment until 11 o'clock? Correct. Well, he can do his off-site sales. Yeah. Right. But, yeah, so I, I, I just want to make sure that. Yeah, I just think for the hotel next door, we have to have some consideration to I would, what. I would agree with you, Susan. However, I think that the, all of the deck, like Zelda's entire deck, closes at 10 p.m. They they produce so much noise just on that Esplanade Strip. I just feel like penalizing a mercantile just in hours of operation just seems a little unnecessary. Even, I mean, I understand that they're right next to the hotel, but it's it just, I've stayed in that hotel. It, I, all I can hear is Bay Bar. I don't hear anything beyond, right. you know. I mean, that's what she, I, she talked about when I talked to the manager there that, you know, noise is a real problem for them, and the Bay Bar is the main one. And, but they do enforce the bay bar to close their doors, you know, when the noise gets. Um, but at ten o'clock, they're going to be pulling all their business into their functional uh, lounge room, right? I mean, that's just that's yeah. at eleven o'clock, and then they're they're allowed. If they, to only, if they only have the business going on indoors and the doors are closed, then that could stay open, but there could be no one on the outside patio. Uh, having, um, you know, drinking or doing anything beyond 10 o'clock. And that seems consistent with the rest of the Esplanade rules and operations. Yeah, I can live with that, but no outside consumption. That's your motion. I can second it. Okay, we have first and second. <laughs> Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Vice Chair Christian. I'm uh, Vice Chair Jensen. Excuse me. Aye. And Chair Christensen. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> We're at the everything's. Well, this isn't a well, discussion though because it's it's a public hearing, so everything has to operate on regimen, and I think you could direct your questions to staff. If, if I'm right. <laughs> I mean, not right now, but I'm at not, a later time. Not, yeah, in this calendar. I, I can I can talk with yeah. Katie. Um, I just had a question. For, um, are, this meeting not over. No, we're not. We're still we're still in the meeting. We're we're moving on. So we made a motion, and we if you if you need to have if you have questions, if you can <laughs> talk to staff after the the hearing is concluded, or tomorrow. <laughs> That, I mean, yeah, we, we have we have to move on to the next part of our our meeting, and we can definitely work out any details tomorrow. So, are we on commissioner's comments or questions? Or um, yeah. So, moving on to well, do you want to do you have a question or part I of the discussion? Let's take a moment for um, if you guys want to. If you have continued conversation, you have to take it outside. I apologize. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Every um, so where are we on the agenda? Where are the director's report? Yeah, item seven. Um, yeah, I pretty much summarized that earlier. I'm looking forward to bringing back more information on the housing element, hopefully for a final adoption hearings. So I actually read your housing element. Only people have too much time on their hands to do something like that. Um, it, and I do have to say, I think staff and your consultant, you guys have done an amazing job putting all of this together. But when I finished it, it reminded me that, you know, you talk about putting burdens on producing more housing, putting burdens on, uh, you know, we just have too many burdens coming down from the state level 
on a city the size of Capitola, it's like, you know, the city's going to be forced to hire more and more people to comply with all of the new state mandates that are coming out. And I think it's sort of a, uh, you know, it's a cycle that's not going to work well for all of us. We need to figure out how to simplify things and what happens in, in towns like Capitola or Fresno or Modesto are different than what's going to happen in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And uh, if we can't sort of filter things down, we're all, we're all going to be in trouble because we're just going to spend all our time processing and writing reports. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, but you guys did it. It's ridiculous yeah. for a town of 10,000 to have to produce a document like that and the time and money and energy that goes into it that it could have gone into a lot more worthwhile things for the community and actually probably provided some low income housing. So that's just my gripe. Um, regarding the report itself, I read it too. I don't know if you saw my comments. I, I got confused on the increases in the numbers of available units. It looks like we open up the mall to everything that's in the mall now. Yes. All properties. Yep, for all properties. The likelihood of them all redeveloping in the next eight years is, you know. Um, yeah, I guess that's but, a good question. But, but, we, but we have um, opened it up to all properties to the 75-foot height. And I think it, it makes sense. It's in an area with the metro um, connection. 75 feet could make a viable project there with commercial. Um, and commercial is really what we're, we're striving to do, commercial and housing on that site. But the overall number of units, especially market rate, has increased significantly because of that request. Unfortunately, we don't have much of a buffer with the new numbers. And that, that is the one area that concerns me, but on not in the housing element. But we do have um, some other properties in Capitola we could lean on if we ever need to do a no net loss for property for development that comes in under our housing element. There's, you know, we talked about 600 Park tonight, that that's one. And then also uh, at the entryway of Bay Avenue, there's sites. So we do have more available sites, but um, because after two years, if you, or two cycles, if you have the repeat sites on your housing element, then they're subject to, um, just an administrative approval. So we really don't want to put too many sites on there because in 16 years, that next, it's going to be an issue of how many, you know, finding those sites for any sites that haven't been developed if, if the housing element by state law is the same as it is today. So. Probably the worst. Yeah. But, Did but, you want to talk about anything else with well, that site and opening I mean, are they up. going to look at the additional space to say, well, that's not feasible to get it developed in six years, and therefore they won't allow that? I guess that's my question. They won't allow us to increase the numbers. We went up by, you know, six, seven hundred units, right, on the mm -hmm. mall property as well, the whole mall parcel, set of parcels. I don't know. I mean. Yeah, under today's economics, it's feasible, but, it, yeah, but uh, the economic Economics of that site will change over time. Right, and, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I guess we'll see what see what they decide. All I can do is hope. <laughs> right. I don't know if that's that that an option. <laughs> oh, that is for them. Yes, the state can say no. Yeah. Great. Okay. And I have um, I just have a, a comment and a one question for you. Um, first of all, um, thanks Brian for sending out the links to the last time for all the permits and stuff. That was very helpful. Appreciate that. And then just a question, Katie, um, just inquiring about, not to bring up signs, um, but where we are we with the signs with like some of the buildings down there along the Esplanade on like East of My Heart, uh, Mai Tai, you know, seeing those buildings kind of finish up and wrap up. And I was wondering if there was a summary about that. Yeah, we actually, we have a building permit for Pizza My Heart right now for a sign that um, is in substantial, it, it's just a change of face so it doesn't need to come back to planning commission. Um, we've reached out to Mai Tai, they still have a banner up um, and we're working with them to motivate them towards putting in a sign, so. And there would be a time, lap, a time on that? I mean, like, what, they just don't communicate, with, they just leave a 
banner up. I mean, it just, I just, I look at perception, it still looks like the village isn't complete and almost be better if there wasn't something up there than an old banner that's faded out from a year and a half ago. Yes, so um, we're in May, the summer is upon us, and our regulations say you can have a banner up for 30 days. Um, we've been pretty sensitive to the fact that they've had to put a huge investment into that building and we've not gone out on code enforcement. So for right now, we're taking the approach of trying to have them work with us. If we get to the June meeting and it's, and we don't have an application, I, we could give them a courtesy notice at this point and ask for, we typically do 14 days, but we could make it longer, say 30 days. Sure. An application. I think it'd be sensitive to it, just like to have an end line. You know, the buildings look great, what they did. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, from what it was, how it was designed, and I think we had some input and how then it was changed. It would just be nice to just see that finished up. So. Yes. So we'll. Signs are always a hot button issue. And my thing is, I just think everybody needs to be treated the same on, on theirs. And if you make one business is conform to their signs then all the businesses need to be conform and if it's not working then we need to change our sign ordinance but just ignoring them is not a good use of the time yeah, thank you okay. thank you all. thank you okay so we're adjourned uh re adjourned to the next regularly scheduled meeting june 6 2024 at 6 p.m you know, we might want to consider having a study session on the zoning stuff because it seems like that always takes so long and is so confusing. I mean, some I I would almost.